board team here that I'm going to hit the gavel at 9.30. <laughs> That's right. Well, 9.34. Yeah. Good job, though. We're that here. one's wrong. Okay. Oh, really? Yeah, that one's wrong. Richard. At least it's not 8.30. Um, so anyway, the first item on the agenda is a, before that, let me, you can. let me show something. And, and this is not my grandchild. <laughs> so Gary, yesterday, remember he's been telling us, Gary's wife, and the name of the baby is... Is she a boy or girl? Lena, and she, Lena. everyone's healthy. Uh, oh, she's beautiful. Uh, she's got, she's really alert and sweet. She looks like Gary. So Craig's going to have to give the Teacher of the Year report later today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he'll Show keep this. him here after lunch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which maybe isn't a good okay. thing. No, it's not a good idea. <laughs> um, So let's, at any rate, the order of approval of agenda and order of priority. Are there any items to add or delete from the agenda today? How do I get rid of it? If not, I take a motion. Move the agenda. Moved by John, supported by Lupe. Further discussion? Get that All in off favor, here, aye. please. Aye. aye. Opposed, say. Opposed, say. Opposed, same. And, um, Merck, please. I'd like to introduce the people seated around the table to you. To my immediate left is Mike Flanagan. He's the state superintendent and chairman of the board. To his left, John Austin, <coughs> president of the board. John resides in Ann Arbor. Next to him, Cassandra Albrich, the board's vi vice president from Rochester Hills. Dan Varner, the board's secretary from Detroit. The next person is Lupe Ramos-Montini. She's from Grand Rapids. And you've just heard the Michigan Teacher of the Year has other things he's doing today. <laughs> Across the table is the Governor's Office Education Advisor, Craig Ruff. Next to him, Eileen Weiser, board member from Ann Arbor. And Kathleen Strauss has just stepped away for a minute. She's board member from Detroit. Michelle Fecto is the board's NASB delegate. It's their association, National Association of State Boards of Education. And next to me on his way is Richard Ziley. He's the board's treasurer. Thank you. And I wanted to clear up something first thing that I think <coughs> is, is worth doing at the same time. Uh, mention to the board what I announced to the Ed Alliance yesterday. Um, I was at a deficit hearing, which I'm summoned quarterly, as you know, to speak about deficit districts. And in that hearing, I was specifically asked about, um, as I'm asked every meeting, what is it that you would do to help these deficit districts? So for the last two or three quarters, I've said things like a Marshall Plan, we need some resources dedicated to these folks. This is often a result of severe declining enrollment that they can't catch up on. In the case of Detroit, they built up a deficit when they had 200,000 kids and they're trying to pay it off with 50,000 kids. So I'm trying to give them some insights as to why this isn't as simple as just getting out of the deficit, you know, just make cuts. What I also offered this time when pressed was, you know, I'm wondering out loud, perhaps incorrectly, whether or not school governance should be reviewed because there have been, let's talk about a specific one, had Detroit Five years ago, whenever it was, when Governor Granholm appointed emergency manager, had Detroit in this room had the votes with its school board to implement the plan that they submitted, there never would have been an emergency manager in Detroit. So the issue was, the issue was to have a, um, to make a comment that that's difficult to do. You're an elected official. Most of the time, these folks are community members. Um, they sometimes haven't signed up for this duty, and I just wanted to make it clear to the legislature, this isn't as easy as you think. Um, at any rate, what I'm going to do, I've only done this once before. My first month here, I had a state superintendent's task force on curriculum. That task force resulted in what ended up being the Michigan Merit Curriculum. After the board considered it, the board approved it, we went to the legislature. I don't think this is going to have any legislative impact, but I think... This gave me an opportunity when MASB responded. I, I talked about this at Ed Alliance yesterday. I'd appreciate a call for us so that we could have some context for these issues rather than, but at any rate, 
Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have a, a state superintendent task force on governance and ask each of those each of those organizations to have a member here that we can talk through some of the issues because I think what we're able to clear up with that group yesterday is governance is already a patchwork. We've dissolved districts. We have emergency managers. We have the follow-up to emergency managers called consent agreements. This has just been a patchwork of legislative <coughs> enactment, enactments that have changed governance dramatically already. So let's try to sort some of this out through dialogue. I think at most it's going to be a dialogue issue because I don't know that there's any legislation that necessarily comes out of that. But I hope it's going to bring some sense to the idea that if we think we have what we had in the 50s in terms of school board governance, it's already changed. And it's changed fairly significantly. And then under the Granholm Law on so-called schools going into the state reform office, that's also going to have an impact because suddenly those school boards will not have direct governance over those schools that go into that district. So I, I thought I'm going to get ahead of this a little bit before a year from now possibly when we have to consider some schools like that. I wanted the board to hear that directly from me. And I think one other thing I'm just going to say right up front here. I did not make a decision on the EAA and giving them a year's notice on uh, canceling the contract with them because of their MEEP scores. I still don't even know what their MEEP scores are. So, you know, a lot of the banter back and forth, the pro-EAA people, the anti-EAA people, it's getting quite distressing. I can tell you this, we don't think about that at all here in the department. We're trying to think about what we need to do in the interest of kids, and some of these kids are in places that none of us would want our kids or grandkids in. It's only a few places out of 4,000. They're getting tremendous supports, by the way, for three years, and the overwhelming number of the 200 or so that are in that are doing a tremendous job. They're turning themselves around. They're doing it with high levels of poverty. And I mean, we're going to celebrate those uh, in this coming year. There's a very few that will have another year to try to turn themselves around. Um, even with the supports they have. But I just need to, I just need to lay that to rest because there's even been some exchanges I know with board members. That this, I don't even know what their MEEP scores are now. So that decision had nothing to do with that. This was strictly to say what I've said for three months. I, as state superintendent, under the law, have a responsibility to place schools, and I need more options than just the EAA. It's just that simple. So if I could, sorry to get that off my chest right at the beginning here, and if you'd like, we can under my section have more talk about that later. And we have guests today, and I, I, I really appreciate what John's done and the whole board, but John particularly in spearheading the discussion on school organization and finance. And you've really got some iconic folks here today. I mean, Jeff I've known for years and respect his work at the Citizens Research Council, and David Arson, some of us got a chance to see him over recently at a Michigan State event where he just did a tremendous job in helping us understand the state of finance right now, and we're going to have another shot at this in a moment. And then Craig Thiel, who's relatively new to the Citizens Research Council, we happen to end up on a plane together with our families uh, within the last year, and uh, good job, Jeff, in bringing Craig on board. Um, and the, what we talked about in agenda planning is that uh, the Citizens Research Council will present for 20 minutes followed by questions and comments by board members. Then David Arson from MSU will present for 20 minutes, followed by questions from board members, and we'll move on from then. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to John for a more formal introduction of this. Well, thank you, and I, I, I trust and I'm sure we'll come back to some of these big topics that you talked about, the opening the EAA, the turnaround strategy. I think we'll definitely want to have some discussion about the special education process, too, as we go through the day. Um, but uh, we do want to take advantage of our time and, and really appreciate that we are continuing to benefit uh, from having these kinds of public discussions, uh, soliciting some very important uh, and broad perspective from both experts and soon stakeholders in education about 
you know, what is um, putting stress and, and what are the major issues that are challenging <coughs> finances and performance of our education system and what are some ideas and recommendations informed uh, from different perspectives about what the directions for major changes might be so we can collectively as a state uh, get our heads around these and begin to work together towards some of those directions. So as uh, Mike indicated, we've got uh, folks from Citizens Research Council who have a long, independent, credible record of important work on school, school finance issues, and uh, Mike pretty much introduced Jeff. Jeff's the president of uh, CRC, uh, was at the, the director of the Office of Revenue and Tax Analysis in the Department of Treasury and other roles in Treasury prior to that. And Craig Thiel uh, is back at CRC, where he served for many years as the State Affairs Director and is now uh, certainly taking the reins of the education uh, leadership that CRC has provided. <laughs> uh, we're going to have about uh, a little less than an hour, 45 minutes, 20 minutes for you guys to present and then enough discussion until we need to move on to uh, Professor David Arson from MSU. So thank you very much. Thanks. Um, just want to say a brief word about the Citizens Research Council and our work, and then I'll turn it over to Craig. So if you're not familiar with the Citizens Research Council, we're a nonprofit uh, that's focused on improving public policy in Michigan, and we do that primarily through the publication of nonpartisan research reports. And we have done quite a bit of work in the K-12 area over the last couple years, and there's a list of some of our recent publications uh, in the presentation. Uh, but in particular, topics that we've looked at include school governance, uh, the revenue supporting K-12, uh, how the money is distributed, um, the impact of MIPSERS on the finances of, of uh, K-12 school districts, special education finance, um, and some issues with fiscally distressed school districts. So if you're interested in any of those topics, we do have research papers on that. And then I'm going to turn the presentation over to Craig, who, who's done a lot of the, uh, wrote a lot of these reports, and Craig's going to present some of the findings from our recent work. All right. Uh, thanks, Jeff, and um, thank you to the board and the superintendent for inviting us here. Um, as Jeff mentions, this is a very important topic. CRC has a long history in, in looking at K-12 um, education, especially the organization and finance aspects. Um, um, I wanted to highlight that the second report, I went back in the annals of CRC uh, history, and in 1916, the second report the organization ever uh, produced was on the topic of organization and administration of the Detroit Board of Education. Um, as many of you know, the challenges facing education today in many of our urban areas are unsolved, and I think that's what we were trying to uh, look at and recommend uh, improvements to in 1916, almost 100 years ago. So keeping with that history... <laughs> they must not have taken all your recommendations. Right? A few of them they had. Um, in keeping with the history theme for a moment, I wanted to point out that later this week marks the 20th anniversary of the state statewide vote on Proposal A on March 15, 1994. Uh, the passage of Proposal A ushered in our current school finance system, both the way we raise the revenue for schools as well as how we distribute the money. Um, the vote ended, at least temporarily, uh, nearly two decades worth of public debate and various attempts to address two vexing public policy issues in Michigan, that being the rising property tax burden on Michigan citizens and growing disparities in per-pupil funding amounts for K-12 districts. These two issues were very much interrelated given the design of the school finance system at the time and the heavy reliance on property taxes to fund public education. Um, previous attempts had dealt with one or the other, but. Uh, until Proposal A, we really didn't have something that could uh, address both at the same time. So the architects of Proposal A uh, are to be commended for breaking the serious public policy log jam uh, that had stymied uh, decision makers for a number of years. And I'm certain that they had the best interests of uh, Michigan school children um, in mind when they crafted the system, both in terms of the methods that they uh, recommended for raising the money as well as distributing those resources. And they probably took into account all types of contingencies. Um, but I'm, I'm doubting that they, they saw the changes that Michigan endured in the last 20 years and the effects that the school finance system that they put in place has had on about 1.6 million school children. Um, for the most part, the new system that they put in place uh, met the policy objectives uh, during the first half dozen years, but nobody predicted the economic and demographic changes that Michigan endured again in the 2000s. Uh, these changes gave rise to a number of challenges for public schools uh, beginning in the early part of the last decade and especially in the latter part of the decade. 
and uh, although Michigan appears to have regained its economic footing, uh, considerable damage has been done to many public institutions, including public schools. They continue to face uh, a number of challenges. And for most institutions, it will be a number of years before things look the way they did before the Great Recession. So I want to spend my time this morning uh, calling your attention to a few of these challenges that uh, have kind of crept up on us. Um, these are issues that I believe are ripe for discussion, consideration as you move forward with your recommendations. Uh, the items that I'm going to cover here are not all-encompassing. Um, I think you will and already have. Uh, heard from others that have illuminated some of the challenges facing K through 12 finance and governments. Uh, my approach in bringing these forward uh, uh, as, as challenges is really to provide you with some context, including the, the prevalence of these challenges statewide. Um, next, I, I want to offer insights on how each challenge, challenge affects school finance and student outcomes. And finally, I'd like to highlight some possible responses that you might consider as a way forward. <coughs> Uh, I don't profess to have uh, the answer to one or any of these challenges. Instead, I just want to give you some concepts and ideas on how you might address each as you proceed. Uh, <laughs> others might have additional thoughts, and I'd recommend that you consider them as well. So the first issue I want to talk about, and I, I heard uh, uh, Superintendent Flanagan talk about this, uh, is the issue of declining enrollment. Uh, as you know, Michigan's system of funding schools places a very high premium on the number of students enrolled in the individual district. The majority operating funds come from the foundation grant. Um, that's set <laughs> annually by uh, Lansing. Uh, similarly, categorical grants are distributed on a per pupil basis. Uh, regardless of the reason for the flow of students in and out of a district, the underlying assumption is that the overall cost of a district that a district incurs kind of rise and fall in direct relationship to the number of students being educated. And so while the system's set up uh, so that money follows, follows a child, uh, what we actually find is that the money follows a child, but the costs in a declining enrollment situation often remain with the district. Uh, many of the costs, at least in the near term, are, are fixed, and uh, managing down those fixed costs is, is, can, can be a challenge. So let me first start with a statewide picture, and I'm sure you've seen this graph and are well aware of what's going on here. Um, this is K-12 uh, enrollment going back to Proposal A uh, 1995 uh, through the estimates um, of 2000 and, uh, 2016. So since 2003, we've been in a sustained period of declining enrollment statewide. Uh, enrollments are down nearly 200,000 pupils in the last 10 years. And so there's fewer students in the system than was the case in uh, 1995. And this trend isn't predicted to um, reverse course anytime soon. In fact, um, the school age population in Southeast Michigan, uh, which represents about one half of the current student population statewide, is expected to climb by another 13 percent uh, between 2010 and 2020. And that decline is going to continue through 2013 before it hits an inflection point. And, you know, the causes here are, are, are many, uh, demographics, uh, economics, uh, declining birth rates uh, following the baby boom echo, uh, out-migration following uh, Michigan's lost decade. And these forces are, are largely out of the control of, of state policymakers, these demographic and kind of global economic changes. But uh, what we've seen is, uh, at least in terms of the effects of declining enrollment on uh, school district finances, some public policy, policy decisions have uh, had, a, had an effect. So this slide um, takes the previous picture on statewide enrollment declines and layers on top what is happening as a result of one of those policy decisions, namely the increase in the number of educational providers. The line represents student enrollment, and the bar represents the number of school districts, both traditional um, and charter schools or public school academies. The state has taken uh, a number of steps to expand uh, choice, and this graph shows just one of those decisions, that is the growth in the number of charter schools. Um, the numbers, since the declining enrollments statewide have, have uh, taken effect, uh, charter schools have increased in number from 199 to uh, about 277 schools. So as the number of public school students decline because of these, you know, global uh, influences, decision makers in Lansing are increasing the number of unique educational providers. 
Um, so if you think of the enrollment as a, as a, a pie, um, the pie is being um, shrinking and um, the, the pie slices, the number of pie slices is, is increasing. So there are some providers whose piece of that pie increases, but as I'll show here in a minute, we're only talking about a relatively small percentage. Uh, for the great majority of school districts, declining statewide enrollments coupled with the addition of, of more providers yields fewer students and therefore fewer total resources. And I should also note that in addition to the increase in the number of providers, other choice expansion policies have contributed to the declining enrollment at school district level. Um, the state has enacted a number of policies that made movement between school districts, inter-district choice easier. So this slide is intended to show how the various forces, these demographic, economic, and policy decisions have con contributed to affect um, enrollment changes between 2003 and 2012 at the individual district level. For this chart, I'm showing uh, enrollment in traditional public school districts only, so this excludes what's going on in charters. Uh, declining enrollment is a phenomenon statewide, regardless of the type of district, whether it's urban, suburban, or rural. Um, overall, enrollment in traditional public schools is declined by 220,000 students, or about 14% uh, between 2013 and 2012. Um, city school districts have been hit uh, particularly hard, losing 32% of the total student enrollment between 2003 and 2012. Um, City school districts account for about 60% of the total enrollment decline in public, public districts. Um, in 10% of these districts, um, you can see the three districts there, have experienced an enrollment decline of, of more than 50% over this period. So while uh, declining enrollment isn't a limited to just urban areas of the state, uh, it is acutely um, a, a problem there. And in this slide, I, I, I show what the city school districts or urban enrollment changes have been. Uh, I draw your attention to the left side of the graphic. Um, those districts with the largest losses, Pontiac, Flint, Detroit, all have enrollment losses exceeding 50%. Uh, Detroit's loss is a shocking 67%. However, this does include the, the effects of transferring the, the 15 schools uh, from DPS to the EAA. All three of these districts, have, as I know you are aware, are facing serious financial challenges, and in part, um, this is a, uh, a result of the annual uh, enrollment declines. On the far side are those districts with enrollment gains, and one I'd like to point out uh, that really stands out is what's going on in Kalamazoo, with the Kalamazoo Public Schools and the Kalamazoo Pub, uh, Promise there. Uh, this economic development tool is credited with reversing the district's decade-long uh, enrollment trend. Uh, the, the Promise, as, as you, you might know, is a guarantee for graduates of KPS to attend uh, college for free. So there's two sides to this declining enrollment narrative. Um, the first is the effect at the state level, specifically the state school aid fund, and this is largely a good story. The other is the effect on local districts, and this is where um, finance challenges are, are apparent. Um, again, because the system is highly centralized, heavy reliance on state level taxes, lancing decisions about annual outlays and per pupil dollars, fewer students allow decision makers in Lansing to increase the per pupil grant. Um, in effect, fewer students uh, makes the school aid fund stretch a little further. In recent years, each time there's been a bump in the per pupil foundation grant, a portion of that increase is really just attributed to the fewer students and not necessarily the level of resources that state officials are dedicating to K-12 education. So the other story, the one that involves uh, more difficult financial repercussions, has to do with the effects on local district budgets. Again, because money follows a student, fewer students means fewer resources, both through the foundation grant as well as the categorical uh, state grants that are distributed. Even if the per pupil grant increases year over year, the losses of students is likely to negate any funding increase uh, associated with the grant. So for districts with declining enrollment, the overall effect is fewer total resources. Faced with fewer resources, districts are forced to adjust their spending accordingly. It's assumed that fewer resources should be able to be translated into lower spending immediately. So again, I'd say that, yeah, money follows the student, but some of the costs don't necessarily follow the student in the short run. And this is a problem that we, we hear of, uh, referred to as, as managing down. And why is this difficult for 
districts to manage down? Well, consider for a moment the nature of K-12 spending. K-12 education is largely a people-intensive operation. Seventy percent of the spending is tied up in salaries and benefits, and the vast majority of this uh, people spending is dedicated to instruction, so not instruction, non-instructional spending. So cutting staff, at least in the short run, is a challenge. Um, and I want to just kind of walk you through some numbers here. Um, I looked at uh, a local school district, not to point fingers at anybody, but uh, an average school district of the state, um, Stockbridge here nearby. It's got about 1,500 students, median, which is about the median size school district in the state. Uh, it had an average uh, uh, an enrollment decline last year, uh, equivalent to about the statewide average, about 1.8 percent. So uh, the district lost about 27 students last year, a, a clip, which would be equivalent to one classroom or one teacher, right? Well, consider where these students are located in the district. Uh, across one, maybe two elementary schools, uh, one middle school or one high school. Uh, the 27 students are not situated in a single classroom or a grade, let alone a single school building. Because of this, the district can't just decide to eliminate an entire third grade classroom um, and the expenses that go along with it. It's not likely that the district will uh, decide to eliminate a third grade classroom and spread those kids further. The bottom line is that the declining enrollment environment, uh, the reduction in revenue, just can't be translated into spending reductions immediately. Again, part of the challenge of managing down, um, at least from a per financial perspective, has to do with how we structured this per pupil grant. Um, the grant's designed to represent the average cost of educating a student, uh, not necessarily the marginal cost. So what's happening in an unstable envir uh, enrollment environment is that school districts are unable to lower their average costs in a timely manner to reflect the, the loss of revenue. Um, there's an important distinction here to be made between average and marginal costs. Uh, economists like to talk about this, 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 uh, this difference, um, so let me, let me explain. Um, the average cost is, is calculated when you take all your costs, that's the instructional, non-instructional, uh, across all student types, all grade levels, and divide that, that cost figure by the number of students. So the average cost includes fixed costs associated with education, so that might be capital, that might be the uh, debt service on, on, uh, on bonds that have been issued, um, administrative costs. But it also includes largely um, the labor as a fixed cost, at least in the short term. Again, as I cited uh, in the example of the average school district, uh, Stockbridge, um, cutting a, 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 a one teacher to uh, accommodate a 27 student loss is, is really impractical in that, in that near term. Marginal costs, on the other hand, represents the additional costs incurred when educating just one more student. Uh, marginal costs don't include these, these fixed costs because these costs don't change with necessarily with the number of students. So thus, um, with declining enrollment, it's hard to reduce these fixed costs. Um, there's also a time ele element uh, associated with average and marginal costs. Uh, the average cost represents the cost over time, whereas the marginal cost represents the cost at any particular point in time. So adding or subtracting a few students from a district in a single year are not likely to affect the district's overall costs in either direction. Um, economists will tell you that over time, uh, all costs, including those in the educational setting, uh, labor, um, are going to be variable. So over time, we would expect that average cost to come down, but immediately it's not the case. Um, how does the school finance, um, or specifically the foundation, acknowledge this difference? Well, it really doesn't. Uh, in the past, the state had strategies to help districts manage down. These strategies were intended to kind of soften the impacts of declining enrollment. Uh, there was a separate categorical grant. We played, they played with the, uh, the weighting of pupil memberships between the previous year and the current year. But those uh, policies and those decisions have, uh, have um, largely gone the other way to favor more of the uh, picture, the enrollment picture in the current year as opposed to what might have been the case in the previous year. Uh, both of these strategies were intended to kind of uh, help districts manage this declining enrollment, um, but they weren't altogether a, a silver bullet, bullet solution. Uh, 
I'm going to save my recommendations on declining enrollment till the end, uh, so kind of leave you hanging. <laughs> um, this, the second challenge I want to bring your attention to is special ed finances, and we, we looked at this issue um, a few years ago. And so why do we focus on this here? Um, first, because it's a significant number of, of school children in the state are directly affected. About 13% of the children in the state have individualized education plan and qualify for some kind of service. Um, the services these children receive are governed largely by federal and state mandates. Second, the public spends a lot of money on the related services for these children. Uh, it's the second largest outlay in the school aid budget. Third, the challenges associated with special ed are sufficiently different from discussions of general K-12 finance that they should be addressed separately. And then finally, uh, <laughs> what we found is that some of the financial demands associated with meeting the federal and state mandates have exacerbated the fiscal uh, struggles of many school districts. So let me start with a, a pretty high level overview of special ed finances. In, in this graph, I present the picture of the per pupil spending uh, in inflation adjusted dollars for the period 2000 through 2010, both for the special ed and total K-12 um, per pupil spending. A couple things to note here is the gap between the two and then the growth trends. Um, it shouldn't surprise anyone uh, that, that there's a, a difference between the two. Um, in terms of that gap, a host of factors account for this uh, nearly $4,800 uh, uh, per pupil difference, additional specialized staffing, ancillary services, smaller class sizes in the special ed setting, and some transportation costs. Uh, studies have shown that degree, the degree to which per, per pupil special ed spending exceeds uh, per pupil spending for general education students. Um, studies have shown that some of these differences can be up to eight times um, greater for the special ed population for um, impairments such as uh, blindness or visual impairment. Um, real special, now turning the attention to what's going on with the growth, um, the real special ed spending increased by about $2,000 per pupil compared to an increase of just $130 for the total K-12 um, spending over this period. Special ed saw continual annual increases, but the general end trend in total K-12 uh, per pupil spending has been one of stagnation. So even though uh, Michigan endured uh, considerable uh, economic challenges um, throughout this period, uh, special ed finances on a per pupil basis uh, seem to have, have bucked that trend when the total K-12 uh, has remained somewhat stagnant. The other thing we wanted to look at um, when we looked at special ed finances was some variations across um, the state across school districts in terms of per pupil spending. And what we found was that the uh, disparities were quite large. Um, the, on the low side of this graph, over on the left side, um, per pupil spending uh, hovered around $9,000. Uh, seven districts, in fact, were below the $10,000 per pupil mark. And this is data from a report we did, um, uh, and, and so it's a little uh, dated um, in terms of uh, its uh, the years that we, we, we looked at, but I, I'd say the, 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 the disparities probably haven't changed much um, in the few years since. Uh, on the high end, uh, we find districts that are spending around $19,000 per pupil. Um, two districts, in fact, uh, spend more than $18,000 per pupil. Statewide, the average is about 13,800. Uh, uh, and this number ends up being closer to the, the high end because many of the larger districts here are represented um, on the, the far right, pulling that average up. Okay, good. we're about halfway through your presentation, and I, this is good stuff, but can you try to accelerate a bit so we get through and have a chance to talk about it? Okay, sounds good. Um, so this, this gap's widening, we found. Um, uh, when we looked at the ratio between the low and the high, it increased from about 2 to 2.2 um, over this period. Um, there's been little effort to uh, reduce disparities in per pupil funding in special ed. This is uh, in contrast what's happened in the general ed setting. As we know, there's been an attempt to, to raise the bottom, and we see that when we look at the ratio of the highest to the lowest, or the lowest to the highest um, foundation grant, and that ratio declining from about 1.74 to 1.7 over this period. And again, this is um, uh, 
policies aimed directly at reducing uh, sp uh, disparities, uh, Proposal A, and then legislative. Uh, So what contributes to these disparities? Um, it's primarily a, a function of the uh, property tax. Um, the property tax is the, is the largest contributor to special ed financing. And unlike in the general ed setting, uh, local communities still set the spending levels, not the state. So uh, although property pr proposal A did institute a cap on local taxes for special ed, uh, it kind of froze in place those disparities and allowed those disparities to, to perpetuate. And in this table, I just present um, those districts with the highest and lowest per pupil amounts uh, from the special ed levy. Again, this is the single largest uh, funding source, so it stands to reason uh, that it would account for a good portion of the per pupil uh, funding differences. I'd note that the uh, highest spending uh, districts uh, benefit from both higher tax rates as well as greater property wealth. Even if the poor districts wanted to spend more for the services, their ability to raise additional funds would be limited by the tax base. And um, some of the challenges uh, that we found um, with financing special ed uh, had to do with what was going on with the interaction between um, Headley and Proposal A uh, following the uh, housing crisis, uh, bursting of the, the housing bubble. Um, this chart shows that uh, strong growth of the property tax was coming under considerable pressure as of 2011. And while aggregate um, tax yields declined in 2010, this did, it did not translate into uh, per pupil uh, reductions because of falling student enrollments. However, uh, enrollment in declines in 2011 were not sufficient to prevent uh, against the per pupil revenue decreases. Um, there was an estimated decline in the uh, special ed uh, tax yield in 2011 of 3%. The actual uh, statewide declines, I looked those up, uh, were 4% in 2011 and then another 2.4% in 2012. Yeah. Again, um, the declines in the property tax base affect all districts, but it's going to be particularly harmful for the poorest districts in the state where spending levels are already suppressed uh, relative to the wealthier districts. The other challenge we looked at with special ed finances had to do with cross-subsidization, uh, that is um, uh, resources that uh, might be uh, dedicated or allocated to general ed having to be switched over to finance uh, special ed services in the state. Uh, this isn't a new phenomenon. It's uh, always been this case. Um, districts have to decide whether or not they're going to raise the, the, IS, the general uh, ISD property tax or contribute, ask their local districts to contribute more from their general fund. Um, this uh, general fund contribution uh, is required largely because of state and federal mandates to deliver these services. Um, so there's built-in policy that's directing um, uh, this cross-subsidization um, to, to occur. Um, keep in mind that the federal government has never fully financed the, the special ed uh, requirement that it's set in law to do. Um, and the state is only uh, financing a, a, a portion of that as a result of the Durant decision. So uh, finally, I want to talk about the fiscally distressed school districts and, and the challenge that are raised by what's going on there. So this is kind of the culmination a little bit of, of the, the previous two uh, challenges that I mentioned, uh, declining enrollment and uh, <coughs> the uh, special ed finances. Uh, you know, I want to say that in each case, uh, the, the situation is unique, so there's not uh, one specific cause that's uh, causing districts to, to dip into deficit. Um, but there are um, some common uh, factors that are involved. Um, what we're seeing is that more and more districts are facing financial difficulties, and this is reflected in the number of districts with emergency managers. There's four of those, uh, dissolution of two school districts, uh, because of uh, their inability to uh, uh, manage finances. Um, so in a di um, so those kind of public uh, examples of fiscal stress, um, 
are also bolstered, um, or that, that narrative is bolstered by the data that's presented here. And this is a slide that I borrowed from the Michigan school business officials that shows the deterior deteriorating uh, fiscal condition of public schools as measured by their fund balance. Uh, these are district savings accounts. Uh, you, they use the fund balance as one technique to uh, help them manage down, but obviously as a because that's a fixed pot of money, that can only go so far. So what we see is more and more districts are tipping into these fund balances. These uh, uh, fund balance uh, numbers are, are declining. And uh, as a result, more and more districts are getting closer to the edge in terms of uh, ability to deliver services. Um, this slide gives us a perspective on you know what's happened with state funding and how state funding may have uh, contributed to um, financial distress. Uh, this is the foundation grant and the effect of the uh, uh, retirement contributions that are, are uh, mandated. Uh, the yellow line is based, the yellow portion of this graph is uh, the portion of the foundation graph, uh, foundation grant that's available after um, you've paid your uh, retirement contributions. And we can see uh, through about 2011, uh, pretty stable, slight increase. And then in 2012, it drops considerably. Um, those are the dollars that are, are, are available to districts um, kind of for the current programming um, after you've subtracted out the, the retirement contributions. The red line here takes that uh, yellow line and then just uh, scales it to what's happened with the consumer price index. So there we've seen a, a pretty uh, obvious uh, deterioration of the uh, amount of resources that are available after we've uh, contributed to the, the retirement system. Again, the, the state has a, a number of responses uh, to financially failing districts. And for the most part, um, the, the one that's been on the books for the longest, the deficit elimination plan process functions well for districts. Um, we find districts who are uh, entering deficit, uh, uh, setting down with uh, the department here and, and coming up with a plan and, and getting out of deficit in the, the time allotted. However, for um, those districts that have been hardest hit by financial challenges, uh, the state really lacks a consistent policy, and the responses have varied. We've uh, charterized uh, two districts, Muskegon Heights and Highland Park, uh, done this uh, primarily through the authority of the emergency manager uh, in those districts. Uh, we've dissolved two districts uh, with Buena Vista and Inkster, and then we've used uh, different tools in the uh, emergency manager law to uh, manage Detroit and Pontiac. So some of the consequences of the, this kind of ad hoc approach, uh, we, we, we see that there's an interruption of student learning, sometimes abruptly and at mid-year. Um, we really aren't ahead of the curve on this, and so we're in a reactionary mode and don't know, um, you know, or, or may not have an ability to step in right away um, because and oftentimes it's, it's too late and, you know, student learning can, can be affected. Um, we find that some of the state responses socialize uh, the, the deficit elimination solutions. And what I mean here is that uh, the state ends up providing extra dollars to these districts to help them solve their financial problem, but it comes at the expense of other districts. Um, um, the example is repurposing the, the 18 mil local homestead tax to, to satisfy the, the deficit. And then under the dissolution scenario, um, we find that the learning environment that uh, students are assigned to uh, may not be any better than the dissolved district. So the question becomes, if they're going to another failing school, is it possible that that school will then somehow be dissolved or, and then pushed on to another district? And it can become a vicious cycle. Um, and then uh, another piece that I think is worth pointing out is that there's an accountability issue here. Uh, state distributes a, a lot of resources to uh, public school districts, and if we see districts failing, um, it raises a question in taxpayers' minds whether or not we're being uh, accountable for uh, these resources that we're sending to school districts. So let me wrap up with some uh, uh, recommendations and then move to questions. Um, as far as declining enrollment, I think uh, districts, 
especially those that are hardest hit. We need to establish a policy and early warning strategies to head off this death spiral, this declining enrollment, which leads to program cuts, which leads to more declining enrollment, which leads to uh, more program cuts. Uh, so an early warning strategy, um, looking at trends. I know there's some private vendors out there who uh, supply school districts with uh, metrics to look at this. Uh, I also know the uh, state has tools available. So trying to identify these districts uh, that are hemorrhaging students earlier and, and heading off that would be helpful. Uh, restoring those state strategies that were designed to provide that uh, kind of uh, easy landing for some districts, uh, especially if it's, if it's a, a temporary issue and this would look at pupil, changing the pupil weights or looking at a categorical grant again to uh, fund decline, to add some resources to, to declining enrollment districts. We have an issue uh, with mixed messaging at the state level where we're, we're asking districts as a response to declining enrollment to consolidate, but at the same time we're increasing the number of educational providers. Um, that seems to me to be a, a little bit of a uh, mixed message and, and the state should be pretty clear what it wants to do, when it wants consolidation to occur and you know what other providers, uh, should, how many other providers should be uh, added to the system. Finally, big picture uh, solution is to re-examine the structure of the per pupil grant. Again, this is in re kind of uh, related to my uh, point that there's costs that are school-based that don't uh, leave the school district when, when the student leaves the district and uh, the foundation grant doesn't consider those. Um, and related to that, uh, we could look at differentiating the foundation grant to take into account different student or school characteristics. Um, again, uh, recognizing that um, there's some costs that just it, stay with the school district regardless if there's 1,500 students or uh, 5,000 students. Um, on the special ed uh, challenges, uh, reducing the reliance on the local property tax um, as the fu main funding source. This will serve to uh, reduce the, the widening per pupil funding disparities. Um, however, this is going to require greater centralization in funding decisions, kind of uh, similar to what we did with Proposal A. And obviously, if we're going to centralize uh, funding decisions for special ed, uh, it's going to require uh, additional state resources. Um, I point out that we, we would probably want to have a minimum tax effort um, at, the, at the local level uh, to participate in the, the state aid portion of the, this uh, recommendation. And the method that would be used would be to raise the bottom, uh, not necessarily bring down those at the top, but uh, raising the bottom to uh, acknowledge that the services that uh, the lesser spending districts are receiving are probably somewhat inferior to what's going on at the higher spending districts. And then finally, um, the state needs to adopt a, a current uh, or a, a clear, transparent, consistent policy on for fiscally distressed districts. Um, the governor and the budget is moving towards that with um, some early strategies, uh, early warning strategies. Uh, I'd encourage you to look to look at what's going on there. Um, this policy is probably going to require that we provide additional resources to those districts that are, are really uh, challenged, uh, both financial and technical re uh, resources. And these shouldn't come um, without any strings attached. We need to demand uh, good management governance of, of <coughs> elected school boards if there's going to be additional resources provided. And I don't think we can uh, just solve the financial problem. We need an educational component if we're going to uh, be trying to solve the financial problem. Apologize for extending. Thank you very much. Thank you for your analysis and recommendation. Thanks, Craig and Jeff and board yeah. members' comments, questions. Dan, please. Thank you. One. Um, always love hearing from uh, the CRC. You guys just give great information. Um, I, the quick question. Uh, so the thing that occurred to me just. Right now, the per pupil, um, the foundation allowance is not averaged out over multiple years, correct? 
And, and would that, what would that, so just walk us through, so if you did average it out over, say, three, five, ten years, whatever, in order to try and even out some of the bumps, because there are so many fixed costs associated with, with, um, uh, with this work, what, kind of just really quickly, what would, what would be the benefits of that, and just off the top of your head, what, what would be the problems with that? Well, if we just took the average of these numbers that I have up here, I, we'd probably end up, because there's some high points and low points, we would probably end up about where we're at right now. I think what the question you're asking is, is that, you know, this foundation is supposed to pay for, foundation grant is supposed to pay for certain costs of educating. Some of those costs, I would argue, are <coughs> fixed costs that don't change when enrollment goes up by three, right. five, or goes down by three or five. So even right. in, in a, a situation where you're increasing your enrollment, your costs don't change that much. So right. there's a financial you don't have incentive. To hire a new teacher yet. Yeah, you don't have to hire a new building teacher. Building. It's not until you have to add that additional right. classroom or that additional building or what have you. Um, so looking at the foundation as breaking it up in terms, in terms of what might be school-based costs versus, you know, current education costs for a individual student or a group of students would, would uh, I, I think, bear some uh, analysis. So I was going a different direction. Oh. I mean, I get that, and that might make sense if you could figure out, if you could distinguish between those costs. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, if you were to average out enrollment over an extended period of time, for a particular district, so that as opposed to their dollar, their their foundation allowance changing annually based on their enrollment, it gets averaged out over the course of that time. Um, would that be just so I can't quite get to okay? What implications does that have if I'm the budget administrator at District X? Yes. So for a declining say? enrollment, we 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 used to look back two years and weight the the number of students. So we, we, we looked back to the previous year and gave some weight to that mm -hmm. enrollment. So that resulted in, you know, dollars going to a district that uh, might have been for a student that no, is no longer there or a portion of the student. But that helps the district or recognizes the fact that those costs don't come down as fast. So if we went back in a, a precipitously declining enrollment district, say Detroit, for example, you know, and, and average that number instead of educating 40,000 students or paying on 40,000, we'd be paying on maybe 50,000. Um, that would be the, the effect of that. You'd recognize in, in providing those dollars that there's these costs that just don't disappear immediately when the kids move on to a different learning environment. And I, I think, too, right, the disconnect between the marginal and the average <coughs> cost gives you the big financial incentive to compete for students. So if you gain students because there's that disconnect, you're a big financial winner. And if you lose students, you're a big financial loser. And if you equalize, if you were to perfectly equalize so that, you know, your costs changed with exactly with the way students, you're sort of removing that incentive to compete for students as well. So, I mean, you know, there's an incentive to compete for students because you're a financial winner if you if you get them because the costs that they bring with them are a lot less than the funding that you get. And so, you know, if you could fix that that one problem, you are diminishing the, the, the competitive pressure as well for, for good and for bad. So the Ann Arbors and Novi's and some others that you showed are picking <coughs> up kids are actually benefiting from it, but the largest number on the left side of that graph that Craig showed are actually... Yes. <coughs> Hurt. Other board members. Well, yes, ma'am. I want to thank you. It's very, mm -hmm. you do a very clear presentation that makes it easy to understand. So I think we should consider your recommendations very seriously. They're, I think they're very helpful. Thanks very much. Eileen and Dan and I'd like to echo the thanks because uh, clarity in this picture is really hard to come by. Um, I've, I'm looking at the other studies that you've done, and certainly we, during, uh, during the deficit management um, process, we see financial pictures. But have you, in the other work that you have already completed or as you are scanning the state, are you seeing districts that are managing their way out of these problems better than others um, academically? not just financially, but academically, because that's a study that would be extraordinarily helpful for all of us. 
you know, the straight answer is we, we haven't specifically looked at that component. Um, there's no doubt that the districts that I that we pointed out that are most challenged have also the most challenging educational uh, pieces too, and so they're fighting kind of two different uh, uh, or two 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 issues. They're interrelated, but they're separate at the same time. Um, you know, the the death spiral I think is an apt kind of description because you know parents look and see that the district's failing financially and academically, they pull their kids out. The kids that are left behind are faced with reduced programming, uh, perhaps larger class sizes, and it just, is, is, it just kind of reinforces itself. And, <coughs> but to answer your question, we haven't done that, that research. The, I, it's an interesting point because we see schools that are uh, a low income and a high poverty that are doing a good job academically. I don't know what their financial stability is. I don't, I don't know how close they are in their reserves. I don't know whether they're attracting students. But as we try to manage out of this financially, the other question is what's actually working better for kids and achieving more results. And I wish that there were a way to hook all of this together, uh, because I, we have schools that are being the odds. The question is, what are their finances? We could try to connect the dots on the beating the odds schools and see if there's connection, and, and maybe ask for CRC's help on that. Because I think that is a way to look at some of it. There are schools with very high poverty, very low per pupil that are doing pretty well, but most of those that are beating the odds are actually in in better you know situations. Better with lower poverty. Um, and if I just might tag on to that, I, the reason we in-house that intensely work on this deficit, so it's a little bit demeaning when we go to these quarterly meetings and get kind of yelled at by some senators, often the senators, the House seems to be more polite about this, that somehow we're responsible given that they're the ones that haven't funded the system. But putting that aside for a minute, this consent agreement situation is much better than the previous emergency manager issue for the very reasons that Craig brought up. So in Pontiac, when we can engage the Oakland schools and we can engage our staff, it's a burden. I, you know, you won't hear this from Vanessa, but there's no staff to accommodate this yet. We're hopeful that in the October 1 budget that will prevail. The governor has asked for staff to accommodate it, so we appreciate that. But it's a so much better situation because you're not just in there saying cut, cut, cut. You have an education plan that, that is thoughtfully considered, approved by their local board, by the way, so they haven't lost governance when you do a consent agreement, whereas under the old rules, basically you're out suddenly and it's just an emergency manager and it's just cut the budget. So to your final point, I think it was, Craig, that combination of the ed plan and the finance plan is working so much better at a place like Pontiac and why, in spite of some of the personal criticism I got on giving 10 years to Pontiac, it gives you more hope to try to have Pontiac turn this around in 10 years under a consent agreement than you could, frankly, do under the traditional old emergency manager model. You know, it's still a stretch, but, you know, we're working towards that and hopeful. Um, I think it was uh, Dan and Michelle and Cassandra. Um. Sorry, y'all. I got back in the queue uh, just because it looked like there wasn't going to be there weren't going to be a lot of questions, and now there are. So, all right. Uh, so I'll try and uh, ask them both quickly. One is, so if the if the payment to a district was based on their average enrollment over a much larger period of time, let's say five years, just to have a number, would that cost the state more or less or the same? I mean, so the, the districts that are gaining enrollment, presumably the rate of gain, like the rate of additional payment out from the state would be slowed down a little bit. And for the districts losing enrollment, the rate of pay, the, the rate of their loss payment would be slowed down a little bit. So they would offset, yes? It or? would cost the state more because we're experiencing this declining enrollment statewide. Uh, some people are, well, and you've more got people are leaving the state than coming in. Fixed pool of money, so it would also affect the per pupil dollar. I mean, you could end up spending the same amount of money and you sure. just would average the enrollment and it would change how much you put into the foundation allowance based on the new formula. So you end up spending the same amount, you just distribute it differently. Okay. And then the other quick question was this uh, fiscal distress growing slide that shows the um, fund balances of the various mm -hmm. districts around the state. Um, is the pace, <coughs> so the, one obvious trend is that the percentage of districts that have 
and I've, there's been a larger percentage of districts that have gone into deficit. There have also been a larger percentage of districts that have fallen from, say, a, above 15 percent right. fund balance to a zero to five percent fund balance. Is that pace increasing? Has it leveled out? Or is it slowing down? Or do you know? I, I don't know, but just looking at these numbers, uh, the, the above 15 percent numbers going down, um, you know, in the zero to five is going up. So right. it suggests to me that, you know, more districts are trending towards the, you know, the danger zone. I, the, the above 15 percent is what the school business officials recommend as the uh, reserve, uh, recommended reserve balance. Um, I should note, too, that deficit districts here that I uh, might not meet up with uh, superintendent's report to the legislature, because I'm only looking at traditional school districts, and I've also, uh, the 42 number um, at the far right doesn't include the dissolved, two dissolved districts and the um, uh, consolidated district as well that we're in deficit. Thanks. Thank you. Michelle and Cassandra. Richard? Um, I just wanted to thank you for the attention to special education. So um, I think that's uh, sometimes overlooked, and uh, it's really critical. And the schools I talk to, they're, it's a real challenge. Um, so um, I want to make sure I understand the, the funding for special education and why the disparity is there. So I just wanted some clarification. Um, so you're saying that, that it's pretty much locked in when, when uh, the rates were locked in so the more affluent districts or who, people who paid more for their special ed services when one proposal a came in it just locked it in and those disparities and then it's not been funded properly since is that that's that's one so one okay. of the objectives in proposal a at least with the general ed population was to just look at this per pupil funding and, and narrow that gap right um, special ed was always funded with the um, property local property tax that was a, a large contributor to our uh, to the, the overall pie there. Right. Um, the deal for Proposal A was that we'd cap the rate on those those special ed millages at I think it's 1.75 of what the rate was in '93. So if you were already high spending you it, with your prop and you're basing it on property tax, you can still increase your rate. Your base is, you know. Uh, going going up uh, as at least it was through the later part of the last decade and then because of housing bubble started to come down but so we kind of baked those those uh, disparities and then you know there's federal mandates that you can't reduce spending either so if you're already high we can't reduce spending um, so that's why my recommendation was if you're going to equalize spending in this arena you'd have to bring them up from the bottom barring a change in federal policy um, but that's also probably, uh, you know, based on the proposal A experience, that's how we equalize spending. And based on a, a fairness issue, we probably want to look at those that are spending fewer dollars and bring those up. You also mentioned something about that there was some combination or, like, basic the way I understand it is people are taking f funding from the general ed to support the special ed because they don't have the their resources right. um, to do so so the you know so the federal law basic more special ed kids are sort of uh, taxed more correct if there's a higher percentage of special ed especially particularly special high needs special ed my, my point on talking about the general fund contribution mm -hmm. um, is that uh, when you factor in all of the state dollars that are required from Durant when you factor in the federal dollars that are coming and um, those dollars in total don't satisfy the mandate to provide a free and appropriate public education to special ed students we can't get out of that right. districts can't get out of that how do you how do you fund that well you right. either tax through the property tax you know or the general fund contribution from constituent districts who and in a situation where those districts are struggling to provide the general ed population with programming there's kind of a uh, a mandate that you fund special ed first right, um, right. and and so that's why I talked well, about because yeah, when I'm and what I'm going with that is I'm wondering if some of the, the distressed schools have a higher percentage of kids for various reasons have kids with um, that are special ed or 
special needs. And I, I know, well, for instance, in Detroit, there was a study done by the University of Michigan that looked at the lead levels and that they had some off the scale types of um, <laughs> uh, rates of lead poisoning in certain areas. And they actually had it throughout the state so that <clears throat> um, these are the schools. That, so if you're in an urban area or in a, any area with these uh, environmental hazards that are going to be affecting um, uh, the students, I mean, that, and I'm not sure if that's ever considered in looking at finances, but the, the U of M study was pretty, uh, uh, pretty intense. I mean, it, it showed that there was very high rates, like, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 percent in some areas of kids with lead poisoning. And um, if you're addressing those special needs, those schools are going to be uh, taxed at a um, at a higher rate. So I'm just, you know, it just seems really difficult to be pitting general ed against special ed, and when um, we need to find out ways just to. Michelle, may I say to your point because it's a good one. I, as a local superintendent in Oakland, let's say Pontiac, which I think did have a disproportionate number of special needs kids. Yeah. It didn't impact Pontiac because there was enough county millage to basically handle all the costs, at least back okay. then. No. Moved to Wayne County as superintendent, and it does disproportionately affect Detroit because they not only have a disproportionate number of special needs kids, but we didn't have enough county millage to ca ca cover it, so we had to build back districts. So Detroit got billed back, I think we billed back $40 million, and probably half of that was to Detroit. So Detroit had this you know, double problem. They had declining enrollment, they had the foundation problem that everyone has, and then in addition, they had this disproportionate bill back because there wasn't enough right. county millage to accommodate it. So it just, it, some of it depends on the county you're in and what their, what their millage rate is and, and their property tax base. I think uh, yeah. it's Cassandra and then Richard. Well, I just want to uh, echo my appreciation for the information you've presented today. It's certainly enlightening and helpful. And I had just one quick question, um, and maybe it's a loaded question, and maybe it's <laughs> not answerable today. Um, but your first recommendation is for an early warning system. And my question is, how do we establish a legitimate early warning system when the landscape changes from year to year? So it's like asking a team to come in with a game plan, but we don't know if you're going to be on a tennis court or a football field. But you have to have a game plan. So how, what do you see as an early warning system for, say, a community that could have five new charter schools pop up next year? How do they plan for that? What does that look like? <clears throat> um, I think we, I, I mean, We have a good sense of where things are generally trending in districts. I think we have a good sense of where alternative providers are citing, are, are being cited. Uh, we understand, we look back and we see what the migration between districts might be. And, and using that information we already have should help inform us to target which districts are, quote unquote, you know, likely to face fiscal distress because of declining enrollment. Um, uh, there's gobs of data that is collected by the, the state on, on uh, school finances, and I think there's uh, private entities that are, are using that to help business officials inform their decisions, and I think uh, that's a, a good first step. But once they're that, that cohort's kind of identified, monitor, monitoring them closer, um, again, I'd recommend that you take a look at some of the policies that are being recommended in this budget um, for an early warning system, um, re requiring some districts that are on that uh, kind of risk list to uh, provide uh, more frequent or uh, financial information. Um, as it is right now, uh, as I understand it, it's not until the end of the books are closed till we find out that a district's in deficit, and then we're, we're kind of solving a problem of a year ago as opposed to looking forward and helping a district manage its its challenges right now so that's that would be my my recommendation on, on how we might fashion an early warning system thank you Richard and then we'll go to the good professor okay 
Uh, I do appreciate your, uh, your marshalling these facts uh, for us here. I wanted you to uh, unpack a little more those, the fixed costs um, and identify, uh, for example, I understand that MIPSERS is in part uh, to fund uh, uh, pensions for teachers that, that um, uh, in the past, so that's a, a, a legacy cost. And it, it actually represents, it seems to me it represents a, a tax on the future. And in other words, we didn't pay for our teachers' pensions back in 1980, so we've got to pay for them 30 years later. And, and that actually represents shifting a cost. And ironically, from the prosperous times to the uh, declining times, so how much are, of these fixed costs are legacy costs, how much are are things that perhaps could be dealt with. I'm, I'm thinking I'm living in a district that's one of the deficits. Um, it has two high schools within a few miles of one another, each of which is about 50% half closed, but it's a political hot potato to try to close one of them and consolidate the uh, program. Uh, maybe related to the fact that in 13 years we've had five superintendents and two of them were acting or interims, too. So there is probably weak leadership is probably an accounting. But so unpack those those fixed costs for me a, a little more, if you could. Well, I, I I'd break them down first. If I was thinking of a taxonomy, I would go instructional, non-instructional, and then go down from there. Um, the instructional is basically teachers, and I, you know, I would say in the short run, and I walked you through an example of a average school district losing 27 kids. That's $200,000 of uh, out of their budget. It might represent one or one and a half to two percent of their budget and that average school district per year. You can manage one and two percent declines for a year or two year, but eventually those that one two percent budget reduction accumulates to ten percent reduction and you still can't get rid of that that classroom because you just don't have, uh, you know, the, the number of students doesn't allow that. So on the instructional side, I'd say a lot of the labor and, 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 and teaching costs are, are fixed. On the non-instructional side, I, I, there might be some savings there on, on the fixed costs. You talk about superintendents uh, wearing two hats, uh, uh, food and uh, transportation maybe doing things. but. You know, in smaller school districts, they're probably already they're probably already doing that already. Is my guess. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, um, the other fixed costs, uh, which wouldn't relate to the foundation grant, would be um, like if you've gone out and borrowed uh, to to finance a capital project, um, um, but those aren't funded through the financial through the foundation grant. So it's really not an issue when I think of non-instructional costs. Um, Privatizing, uh, you know, you might be able to, at some point, privatize some non-instructional costs and and get those fixed costs so they're someone else's problem. Um, uh, but but you, you do raise a good point too that you know if you don't make hard decisions when you're you know you can exacerbate the problems caused by your fiscal stress if you don't close buildings when they need to be closed or reduce staff when you can. And, and we've kind of had this issue before in, in talking about the department's policy when the department rushes to help a district to ease conditions in a district and then it allows the political pressure to, you know, um, uh, persuade people that maybe we don't have to close the other high school. Maybe we, maybe we continue along this, this line if, again, uh, sometimes we're, our policies don't have the intended effect uh, and of course that's what we have to struggle with yeah if I can just say that a perfect example is when Carol and, and we have districts in here that are in deficit and you see that 10 years earlier they had doubled the enrollment and they have the same number of schools and this is what I meant earlier it's yeah. difficult for good decent people who've run for school boards to then do that that's yeah. not why they ran to make decisions that people come in and are upset that their local school is gone Having said that, if you had, you know, 20,000 kids and now you have 10,000 kids, you just can't have the same number of buildings. And that's what they finally end up doing, um, I think, maybe to Jeff's point, 
a little later down the road. I'm not criticizing them because this is hard. This is where 7,000 people show up and, and are not happy. John, and then we we're going to go to this. So, but I, I want to thank you. And you all have been among the experts that I've talked to um, uniquely making this point about the marginal cost, total cost difference, which works on the downside when you're losing, but is the incentive to enroll more people. So I want to get you and everybody else thinking about hypothetically what's the fix for that, of that incentive structure? Is it to um, have less dollars follow the student under school choice, or if they attend a new school that's created in the district, that could potentially change that? And also if anybody's doing anything like that around the country to change that incentive structure to stabilize the system. But thank you to, to very much, Jeff and Craig. Um, and let me introduce Dr. David Arson uh, more fully. David, most thank you. Of, many of you know, Professor of K-12 Education Administration at Michigan State University, an economist with specialization in public policy, school choice, school capital, and uh, undergrad U of M, PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. So thank you, David, for joining us. <laughs> Get going. Welcome. <laughs> well, um, let me see how we work this. Okay. So, uh, how are we here for time? Uh, I, I would take the 20 minutes as long and as you if, want. if you can <laughs> oh. keep to that and then the board will yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah. those guys had I'm 20 minutes too yeah, yeah yeah i know we have enough I time cut them off enough time we I'd have say enough do time. what you need to do then yeah. all right well um uh, thank you for inviting you me here much. today it's it's an honor really and, and a privilege uh, I'm, I'm very happy to have this time um you know, uh, and and I'm and, and I'm I'm happy to follow the the list of speakers you've had. You know, Phil Kearney, Mike Adonisio. I I I I respect their work, um, and honestly, I don't have any serious disagreements with what I've heard from any of them. So I commend you on, I mean, that, that, uh, there are some details here that I want to sort of refrain and focus on that, but I think you're, you're hearing from um, credible people, and they're saying things that we need to be thinking about. Um, this is an opportune time to talk about resources uh, needed uh, by our schools and organizational issues. Um, it's great that the state board is living up to its constitutional responsibility in providing leadership on this. Um, and so, good for you. Uh, I'm going to, and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to say this, uh, I, I'm going to try, it's a little hard to do it on the fly, but I'm going to try to um, be complementary to what you've already heard from, from the previous speakers, uh, some of them a month ago. <laughs> Just to, to, to try to give some coherence, if I, to the extent that I can, uh, to things that you've heard. Um, and so let me put back up a slide that, that Phil Kearney started with. You remember he, he offered a framework of principles that, you, that he, he's so gentle. <laughs> he's so wonderful, that guy. You know, he, he is, well, that you might consider. <laughs> Well, I, I, I want to put the slide back up because I think he was on the right path, and I, I think it, it, uh, maybe it, it might be worthwhile considering these principles when you think about these big questions about uh, school organization and finance. Um, he mentioned four, equity, efficiency, adequacy, uh, and choice. I won't go over the details again, just to remind you this. He mentioned uh, a little definition each of that there's some trade-offs across them, necessarily. It's the job of public policy to to weigh those trade-offs. Um, I want to focus here on the adequacy principle, okay, today, um, uh, and, uh, and, and start it this way, uh, because uh, uh, there's a lot of talk about it nowadays, and, and I'm not sure how well understood it is, so I want to sort of give ourselves a, a, a little bit more of a foundation. Um, uh, adequacy is... Uh, is an attempt as a standard 
to determine whether schools receive sufficient uh, resources to meet the outcome goals they're expected to provide. By definition, it's the standard that links inputs and outcomes. Um, and it combines both equity and efficiency. It, it, it's, it's a little different standard than the others because it, it has both an equity dimension and efficiency. Um, and you should know that the concept of adequacy was born as a result of a standards-based accountability movement. Once states started to say what was expected of students, then it became important for courts, for the researchers, for the policymakers to say, well, how much would it cost? So the goal is to identify the base spending needed to teach the average student to achieving rigorous proficiency standards. Like the Common Core, and then, so the average student, and then secondly, to identify how much extra spending schools require to teach students with special needs. So then you're moving into the, 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 the equity part there as well. <coughs> but the proviso is this, using the best service delivery methods, not just more money. It's more modern, <coughs> it's evidence-based, and we've learned a lot in the research community about what works, about things like class size, about, about uh, after school, about special ed service delivery. So it's a concept that has to be embedded in what we know about the relationship between inputs and outcomes. I'm gonna to focus today on three dimensions of adequacy, okay? First, the it relates the overall funding in the system you might think of it in terms of resources available for that average student. Secondly, I want to focus on addressing cost differentials at the local level. Okay? And that will overlap with some of the things you've already heard from the previous speakers. And then thirdly, I want to focus on school facilities because they are also part of the, 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 the provision of adequate services. I'm going to take about three quarters of my time to hit those three areas. And I'm going to then, at the last part, focus on, a, on, 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 on yet another point up here on choice. Okay? And I want to look at the relationship between choice as a standard and efficiency. Okay? And think about balancing these two desired outcomes and how that relates to current policy in Michigan. So that's the plan. Let me pick up the pace. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so on, 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 on this first question of total amount of resources in the system, you know, the first thing I want to make is there are many valid ways of looking at this trend. I'm showing you some figures, and a lot of talk nowadays with an election coming up about what the trends have been in, in, uh, in, in, in school funding. I'm just showing you here uh, quickly. Um, uh, something they put together about the House Fiscal Agency, and you can see this is a this is a trend in funding that shows the 18 local mills, the school aid fund, the the, the, the federal stimulus funding, and the and the regular federal money uh, doesn't include some of the federal categoricals. And the point here is that the funding overall, in nominal terms, uh, is about the same uh, uh, in, in 2014 as it was in 2005-6. Okay, you can see the very tail end. There has been an increase in the last few years. That's true. Okay. But you also see under the title, not adjusted for inflation. Well, if you adjust for inflation, the trends look a little bit different. Right? If you adjust for inflation, you're going to have about a, a $1.9 billion deduction, reduction adjusting for inflation over this thing time span. That's about a 12% decline. Okay. This is using the CPI deflator for Detroit. Uh, if you use the GDP deflator for uh, state and local government service, another one, you, you're going to get even larger uh, declines in real terms. Okay. I, um, uh, so, so a lot of this is depending on how you, you know, how, how, how you, you frame the numbers. Here's another interesting figure. I just do this quickly because the world looks so different from different points of view, and, and people, people are saying different things, and they're both right, and then they're right. <laughs> this also comes from the House Fiscal Agency, and, and, and it's just sort of looking at trends uh, in revenue over the last four years, uh, including uh, the, the 2015 executive budget as the end point. 
And you can see down the bottom, these are numbers about uh, changes in uh, per pupil funding over the last four years. And you can see that there is uh, an increase in, um, uh, in, in, in $900 in state appropriations, $939 in state appropriations, but, but then there's different adjustments as you go down. I won't take a lot of time. If you, if you can see, well, what if you adjust for the 18 mills of the local, uh, local the federal stimulus funding, uh, 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 MIPSERS funding at the, at, the, at the state level, take that out, and the local districts, you can see, with each of these, you get a different number, right? And of course, it's the one on the right that might be of interest to, to local districts as they say, well, their, their money is tight. If you adjust these for inflation, you get even uh, less favorable figures. Okay? And, and so this is the, the, the world that we're living in now. And, and I, I just want to come back here. Um, the first column, the, the, the note that, that, um, that, we're, um, that, that this $939 increase over the last four years translates into about a, uh, a, a, a billion dollar increase statewide. So when you hear there's been an increase in state appropriations of a billion dollars, that's correct. Okay. You've also heard um, that I've seen a commercial. <laughs> the, the governor cut a billion dollars from school funding. Well, that's not quite right. <laughs> right? What, what, we, what happened is that there was a billion dollars that might have gone to the school aid fund that was uh, allocated to other purposes, 750 million for, for a cut in the Michigan business tax, uh, or, or funny money that went over to the community colleges and, and higher ed, okay? So I'm just saying that, that uh, what I'm saying here is that depending on how you frame these numbers, credible people can make different claims that are, in fact, defensible with the data, okay? But this last point is something that I want to point, point to, okay? Um, um, this is a slide that Mike Antonizzo put up. Okay. Someone asked, and this is, this is uh, the, the funding gap relative to Headley, uh, the how much revenue could be uh, uh, generated if we were still taxing ourselves at the same level as when Headley passed. Um, and, uh, and basically, uh, it, 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 if there was a constant level of tax effort, we were devoting a, a, a constant share over time of our income to uh, uh, state revenue. And you can see uh, at, at the end, we're quite far below that, that limit. Um, uh, about, uh, it, it was actually got up to $9 billion. Somebody asked at the last meeting in February, well, what happened since? Well, actually, the number has shrunk. We're, we're down in the range of about uh, seven or eight billion below uh, below the cap. Okay, the point I want to make here is this: Mike Adnisio presented this as a you know a, a change in public disposition, a change in our willingness to fund things through the private sector. I mean, sorry, through the public sector, right? A willingness to sort of devote a larger share of our fund uh, of our income to private uh, uses. Okay. And of course, there's good reasons for that. Okay? Um, but, but it also is a message that, well, if, we, there, if, if the political will was there, there is the, a gap here to increase public spending. Okay? I want to focus, though, on another point here, and this relates back to the adequacy point. It's not just a question, of course, it's, it's not these, these declines over here. Okay? are not just a change in tax effort. They're also a, that the economy slowed down. We have 10 years of re contraction, okay? But I want to focus on one other element. Okay? And this isn't in the slide, <laughs> so you have to listen. Um, and it's the fact that the monies in the school aid fund um, have been diverted to other pur purposes, okay? That is to say um, uh, that, that, that the amount of money available in the school aid fund is has become it's kind of like a slush fund it's, it's kind of discretionary okay and, and 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 so when you think about adequacy as total amount of revenue is necessary for the whole system this variability is an issue okay the house fiscal agency did a, st did a study of uh, uh, not long ago and found that over the last several years about 650 million dollars of programs, 16 programs that formerly per funded through the general fund are now funded through the school aid fund. I mentioned, uh, and that's not including the, 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 the revenue foregone from the change in the Michigan business tax. Okay. Um, early on 
in Proposal A, the shift was going from the other direction. The general fund in the first several years was contributing on average between 1994 and 2001 about $580 million a year from the general fund to the school aid fund. Okay? Now the transfer is mostly in the other direction. Okay? So, but the point here is this. Political whims will always come and go, and, and, and we shouldn't be treating our school aid fund as a, as a slush fund, as a piggy bank. Right? We have to put some boundaries on those political impulses. To say, to say how much money is necessary to fund our schools. Okay? And I appeal here to someone I like a lot who's worked, Milton Friedman. Right? I admire this guy. Milton Friedman took a dim view of politics. Right? And so he insisted that you set some rules on the political process. So in monetary policy, he didn't want the monetary policy to be determined by, you know, whatever the legislature. He wanted constant growth set by rules for the money supply. Trade policy, go with certain rules, set the rules. Okay? And I'm appealing to the same standard here. It's not in the slide. I hope you remember this. Okay. So, um, um, yeah, so we need, we need to peg this. We need to put some boundaries. Otherwise, you'll have have you know folks who say I, I want to build a, a developer <laughs> I want to build a stadium <laughs> well we got some money over here in the school aid fund right? it's time to get elected let's give a tax break but you, you get the point we need to put some boundaries on this we need some rules okay I want on this overall point here um, of course uh, I'm putting up Moody's investor service <laughs> they've noticed Michigan I'm appealing to them because they, of course, are a widely recognized, um, sober voice, and they take a national point of view. They've noticed that Michigan school districts are in fiscal stress. Okay. Just reading, school districts in the state of Michigan have faced unprecedented fiscal stress over the past few years, stemming from direct funding cuts and enrollment declines and limited revenue and expenditure flexibility, by which they meant the local districts don't have the authority to raise local millages uh, if, if, they, if they like for operations. Ratings downgrades in a quarter of Michigan school districts between 2009 and 2012, that is three times the rate for school districts nationwide. Okay. Multi-notch downgrades, six times the rate for districts nationwide. Here's a national, credible national organization saying there's an unusual degree of fiscal stress in Michigan districts. The outlook, according to Moody's, for Michigan school district sector remains negative going forward. Additional downgrades are likely to occur in the near term. You heard from the previous speakers that there are a lot of districts in fiscal stress. Okay. I'm showing you here the aggregate uh, of the fund balances for all Michigan school districts and how it's trended over time. And you can see how it's turned down. So we're just adding up all these fund balances for all the traditional school districts. And of course, it's trended down in recent years. Um, but here's another way of breaking it out. And I just stratified, aggregated the Michigan school districts by their racial composition. And you see a shocking, a shocking line on the bottom showing that districts in Michigan with at least 40% of their students who are African American. So let me sum on this overall. There's been a broadly experienced revenue squeeze in Michigan school districts in re recent years. It's been fairly acute in a fairly significant subset of districts, and we need a better be benchmark of the overall revenue that's necessary. Sometimes folks are kind of pessimistic. They know that just devoting more money to the problem doesn't solve it. And so I want to I want to put a, 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 a note of optimism as you think about this. And you at this table should know this because Michigan stands out among states nationwide as a place where we've demonstrated that money does matter. Okay? How do we know this? Proposal A did something <coughs> remarkable. It created a natural experiment here. It created what is called exogenous changes in revenues. 
across all the districts in, in the state. So unlike when the, the, the changes in revenue come as a result of a court case, where the revenues might be directed on the basis of pre-existing conditions, this was a situation where there are changes in revenues unrelated to current performance. So we can look at the before and after, and we can control for district characteristics. Okay? So this requires high-level statistics. But what it means is it's a causal analysis. Okay? It's a causal analysis, not just a correlation. And I'm talking to two the best studies that have been done on this. They weren't about Michigan policies. I mean, they, they were for researchers. One of them is done by Leslie Papke. She's at MSU. The other by Joy Deep Roy at Columbia University. They come to the same conclusion. Those funding increases under Proposal A significantly improved student learning as measured by the mean. Okay? And that is in a world where the where, where they were not focused in a way that we all could on devoting the increases in spending to the best uses. Okay? So this is just a note of optimism. There's, we can, you know, there's, we, we, we've already done it. Okay. All right, so let me turn to the second point of adequacy. The distribution of revenues of, uh, uh, among local districts Okay. That second dimension of, of adequacy requires that you adjust for variations in local cost. Okay, let me make clear that we understand the term cost. Cost, by definition, is the minimum expenditure needed to obtain a desired educational outcome. It's the minimum expenditure needed to attain a desired educational outcome. You decide to give a more lavish benefit package to your employees, that does not change cost. That changes your expenditure. You understand what I'm saying? So cost is determined by the, all right, so, and this is what we have to adjust for, variations in cost at the local level. By definition, local districts do not have control over costs. Are we clear? Okay. So, and in order to have adequate funding, you have to provide districts with differential funding that adjusts for these costs. Okay. So, um, let me, so proposal A gave us a more equitable system. It narrowed the gap remarkably. I mean, positively, it narrowed the gap in funding per pupil from top to bottom. The largest per pupil gains were in the rural areas because they started out at the lowest level of funding. The total revenue gains per pupil times in Rome are largest in the suburbs. But the point I want to make here is that the system, and, and this is reinforcing the things that you heard from Craig, it fails to adjust for differential costs, which is essential for funding adequacy, the second point. Okay, here's our, our, our this is what Proposal A did. It was remarkable. It's a success. 80% of the students receive per pupil funding on the foundation that's within $500 of that basis, the minimum. Okay. Of course, there's a tail at the top end, okay? But let me show you this. This is the, the change in enrollment and total foundation revenue because the districts, the individual districts care not just about the per pupil, which is in the middle column, but, they, but their total foundation, their discretionary revenue from the foundation depends on the, 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 the product of those two things, the per pupil times the, the number of students. And here you see a, a, a really dramatic story. If you look in the middle column, and this is just for the period from 2002 to 2011. You can see the changes in per pupil foundation. They're lowest in the high income suburbs. Incidentally, the, this is after the great narrowing. Early years of Proposal A, all that narrowing took place. So this is over a period in which the changes from year to year are basically the same per pupil for all the districts. Okay? And it's a smaller, uh, uh, it's a smaller increase, if you $100, $200 for the high income suburbs, because they have a higher level. Okay? But the total revenues on the right, and here you see really quite dramatic changes, that, 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 that in central cities over this decade, they've lost nearly 40% of their revenue. I mean, this is really a remarkable story. I'm going to make two things that I've left off here that make this worse. I didn't want to overstate. 
This does not include that $470 decrease in the per people foundation that took place in 2012. I could have put that slide up here, I didn't, and it does not adjust for inflation. If you adjust for inflation, you're looking at truly amazing numbers, and I'll say to you, if you're a business manager in those central cities, you've been dealt a set of cards that's very difficult to manage. David, we need you to pick up the pace significantly, I think. Okay, we're, we're, okay. What do you want to share? Thanks. So let's, I appreciate that, John. I apologize. Um, so here's the goal. You have to adjust state aid to reflect variations in local costs over which local districts have no control. Okay. We're out of step with the national trend to account for cost differentials. Simply providing more revenue to the lowest districts will not address this problem, will not solve the adequacy problem. Let me tell you, so high cost students, let's go down the list. Special ed, you heard that already. Let me just put it in these terms. Michelle and others, we have a state funding system and the special ed piece is not really part of it. We haven't addressed it. That, 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 this, that, that, that basically about, about a, a quarter, 28% of, of, of the cost of the required costs are covered. And then there's a great variation across, across localities in how they do it. Um, and and, 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 and <coughs> the, the, um, there's differences in, in counties. It makes sense for the ISDs to contribute if they can, right? but, they, they, but they have different ability to pay and they have different willingness to pay. And so, so the, the, we, we have great variation in this. It's sort of left out of the whole thing, and we need to address it. The way, and I agree with, with Craig, high-cost students, also the low income, you know, we're, we're, we're at a low end of, of giving additional revenue for, for uh, at-risk kids. It was uh, it's slated to be 11.5% of the foundation, but we're, we haven't been funding it even at that level. About half of the money that's targeted for that bump for the, the at-risk kids has, has been prorated in recent years. So, so we're, 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 we're falling behind in what we could do. Um, there's other cost differentials, elementary versus secondary, regional cost differences, you know, uh, um, it, it, either for, the, for buying a house in, in place uh, as, as one county versus the next, or, or changes in, in, in transportation costs. These, are, um, these could be addressed and, uh, and, and, and we haven't. Decline enrollment, you heard a great deal about this in the previous speaker. Let me just say that this is an issue of matching revenues with costs. As you heard, I'm just put it simply, the issue here is that in declining enrollment districts, the revenues decline faster than the costs. Okay. Um, and, um, and this is, and, and, and finally, that, there, that these, these different cost differences, these cost differences uh, are, are overlapping. In declining enrollment districts, you're more likely to get a higher concentration of high cost kids, and they tend to be in, in, in high cost areas of the state. Okay, um, so let me just stop here and say that, um, so on this second dimension, we know how to do this. Other states do this. You look at Massachusetts, they're matching their revenues to the cost much better. These are technical issues. They can be solved. Um, uh, yeah, and I'd also say that in, a, in an era where we have more choice, it's essential to do this. The more choice you have, the more important it is to match the revenues of cost, because otherwise, schools, choice schools, have an incentive to attract low-cost students. And by doing that, they, they can lower their average cost, but they simultaneously raise the average cost of the districts uh, obliged to educate the high-cost kids. So any advocate of market system, any market-based market -based reforms will acknowledge this because they understand the power of these price signals. Okay? So, so we need to take it seriously. We like choice. We need to align our, our pricing mechanism with these incentives. Let me turn to the third feature of, of adequacy facilities. Okay? They're totally decentralized. We have a state funding system for operations that totally ignores facilities. It was never a part of Proposal A. The funding of facilities is in a pre-Rod Serrano world, <laughs> it's all based on local ability to pay. It's really a remarkable situation. Okay. Um, 
they're, 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 they're funded by local property taxes, and, those, and the value of property per pupil varies dramatically from one community to the next. The property tax millage rates in some poor districts, it has to be 10 times the level in affluent districts to generate the same level of revenue for their buildings. Okay. This, or one of the few states that does this, we've had a lot of capital spending, mostly in property wealthy areas. The way we do it in Michigan violates all of the standards. Inadequate facilities in many districts, unequal opportunity for students, unequal tax burdens for, for, the, for the taxpayers. We just left it off the table. We need to address it. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just say, we know that it matters. I'll, th there's research behind all these bullets. Uh, I, I, in the interest of time, I'll move it ahead. Some years ago, I worked with, with Tom Clay at CRC and David Plank. We actually analyzed. We came up with ways of measuring the capital stock in every Michigan district. And this is what you find. It, let's organize our school districts. By, by, by their property wealth. And what you see here is, the, is, is quintiles. The, the lowest property wealth uh, are, 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 are the Highland Parks of the world, and the high, high property wealth are places like Bloomfield Hills and other places. And what you see here is that, that in, the, in, the, in the last two columns, the high property wealth areas have school facilities that are roughly twice the value as in the low property wealth quintile, but they're paying one-third the tax price. So this, this, is, this is unfair. Um, uh, uh, it doesn't have to be this way. We're one of the few states that, that, that doesn't do this. Remarkably, we got rid of even the one thing that the state had done in the past, that school bond loan fund, basically permitting, permitting districts to borrow at the state's rate. I, I, I don't get it. Um, it was a puzzle to me why that happened a year ago. Um, this is inefficient. Right? It means that, that local districts have to pay a higher price, if they can at all, to fund their, fund their, their, their school facilities. But we can do better. Let me turn to that last point. Geez, I had some, some, something happen in the reproduction here. These bullets seem out of place. <laughs> Apologize for that. Um, so let me turn to that fine point, the, 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 the matching uh, choice with efficiency. Any, any, any discussion of school organization, this is going to be a key part of the policy discussion. Um, uh, uh, and, and let me say, these are things on this slide that you all know, even though it got a little bit scrambled there, um, uh, that, 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 um, that people in this room are, are familiar with. Let me be clear. Choice is on that first slide because it's a positive value. It's a good thing. But choice is only one value, and you also care about efficiency and equity, and it's the job to, to, to uh, evaluate the trade-offs. Let me... Just note, this is a little uh, sort of pause here for a moment. This board, in thinking about organization, is going to address it. We're in a world where there's a lot of new innovations, a lot of new options for schooling. And you're going to need to think, what, what are the proper, again, the principles, the rules, the guidelines, and saying what, what, what belongs to publicly funded, what's public education, and what isn't. Okay. So, so here's one option for thinking about this. You could, it's just an option. You can think about it in your own way. I have two premises, the first two bullets. Charter schools, cyber schools, and other educational innovations can serve as sources of experimentation and innovation and provide quality educational alternatives. These schools have a legitimate claim on taxpayer funds to the extent that they further the overall purposes of the state education system. So here's the principle I offer. This means these options must be accessible to all students and held to the same high standards of academic, physical, and other accountability as traditional public schools. This isn't the time to pursue, but this is a kind of thinking that I think is going to be helpful in thinking about the choices that are sure to come. Of course, um, one thing to say about, about, um, about uh, a, a choice is that, and I want to emphasize this, is that it matters so much what the state rules are, what the details of the policies are, and there's a great variation from state to state. Um, I know my time is blank, I, I, it is running short here, and I just say that Michigan has a set of policies, both for choice and finance, and the way they interact, that pose serious challenges for, for traditional public school districts. Okay. 
we have a lot of choice. This comes uh, you know, high levels by comparison to uh, 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 other, other places. Um, we also have a lot of charter schools that are uh, an unusually high share of the charter schools are managed by for-profit uh, companies. You can see Michigan's the bar up in the middle. Uh, about 80% uh, of the charters are managed by for-profit companies. Uh, Massachusetts, not far away, is really down there low enough. Right? Now, let me just say, stop for a moment. Some people get excited about this, think this is by definition bad. But I, I don't, I'm not in that crowd. What I think, though, is it means that, that you have operators that are, uh, are, by, are interested in education and interested in profit. And so it's essential for the state rules to, to, to regulate the behavior so it's in the public interest. Okay? And that's what we have to think about. Okay? Um, Can you wrap it up, David, please? I apologize. Yeah. Yeah. So here on this, this this is, this is um, the point I'd like to make about choice on the balancing of efficiency and choice. Right now, uh, this slide is showing a, a, a big increase. We, uh, the, the top line is the total number of districts and starters. <coughs> it's going up. At the same time, it's going down. We have a growing number of service providers, and we have no way to regulate statewide the supply. The provision of charters is, is, is delegated to the authorizers, and so we have studies where the total supply of schools is, is excessive, and we don't regulate the supply to identify those providers right, that are doing a good job. And this is inefficient. Okay. This, if I can, um, because I think this is so important, I, I apologize. Um, we have in Michigan, you know, the whole expectation, I'm an economist, was that choice would, the big payoff wasn't the benefit of the kids in the choice schools. The big payoff would be how choice and competition changed the performance of the traditional system because they'd be subject to competition. That's what the competitive effect promised. It was always the question I was most interested in. Other people were looking at the test scores and the choice schools, right? How did it respond? And here we see something that's unusual in Michigan because we got unanticipated negative impacts on the performance of districts in heavily impacted charter areas. These are highly turbulent settings. And it creates inefficiencies, both in human and physical capital, teachers and buildings moving around. I mean, Detroit is now, you know, I mean, it's, it's a shocking story that the Detroit Free Press put out in the fall. Of $440 million of investment in buildings in Detroit that are now vacant and abandoned that the taxpayers of Detroit are going to be paying off for 27 years. This is inefficient. This is profoundly inefficient. People from around the country, researchers, saw that story. They couldn't believe it. I just say, at this point, of the, the negative competitive effect works through the finance system. And, uh, and it's not typical of, of other states. It's not typical. It, it's what, what, what you see here in Michigan, it, it, it's not, again, Moody's, all right, Moody's talks about that debt spiral, I won't take the time. Here is my high order list of recommendations. I think I have to stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Can I just say, given where we are, too, I appreciate it, David. This is all very helpful, and it, it, I'm beginning to see, and I hope we'll see, if we continue to see some themes emerging about major issues here. Um, so maybe uh, Mike's encouraging. If we have some burning questions for what David presented, um, let's
let's, uh, let's get them. But uh, I really appreciate uh, this analysis and, again, um, raises a couple new issues, too. Uh, I wasn't aware of the studies that showed the positive impact of uh, Pro's Proposal A, enhanced investment on learning, period. I'm just saying, I didn't cherry pick. Right. I'm not aware of any causal evidence that shows anything about that. Dan? Yeah, Craig? You, you implement Richard? the recommendations. Kathy. <laughs> well, give me more time. I'll go down the list. Uh, so I want to thank you um, for both a, um, an illuminating presentation and an entertaining one, frankly. Um, I, I've made a mental note to, to, when I have a chance, go sign up for a class at MSU taught by Professor Yeah, Arsene. right, me too. <laughs> would love you, can, to, you can come tonight. I'm visiting this class. Would love to audit. <laughs> yeah, <I'm laughs> That's not what you were looking for, though. Uh, <laughs> tonight, I've, I've got other plans, but I, I, oh. I will audit a, a Professor Arson class before I die. Um, well, you'd be welcome. Thank you. you. Want to come as a guest speaker next week? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually curious. So, to Kathy's point about how you might implement these things, I have long been arguing for a uh, better effort to coordinate the supply of durable, high-quality district and charter schools to enhance efficiency. To use your words, um, do you have particular thoughts about how to coordinate that supply? Where should that responsibility rest? So on and so forth. Yeah. Um. You know, different states do different things, and I think the, the challenge here is that we have a, um, um, a very decentralized uh, system for the charter piece. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about an exit that, 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 that the department doesn't have control over this. Uh, Mike, Mike has made that point in, in, my, in my, my talk uh, just a, a couple weeks ago. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I, on the one hand, you want the... Uh, you want there to be um, access to new providers. You want them to be able to get into the system, but you also have to have to provide this oversight. Where are schools needed? Where is there excess supply? And and I guess I'll, I'll confess that I'm I'm in in favor either of greater coordination across the uh, decentralized authorizers mm -hmm. or moving in a direction that some other states including some high performing states have and that is centralize it at a at the at the state level for the authorization now that's a that's a big step and so it would require uh, some, some transition but but I think one of those two is, is necessary and I'll just say I didn't go on the slide, but but I think you know Moody's is there too I mean they're they're <laughs> they're sort of pointing to the same the same issue um, you know, choice is good. Competition is good, but it has to be managed. It has to be managed. Um, and so the question is, how does that happen? And I know the Excellence Schools Detroit thinks about sort of identifying the good schools, right? but you don't have control over the supply. Right? And so it, it 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 must be frustrating. I'm imagining it must be frustrating. <laughs> right? Yes, indeed. You know, I might say that it was interesting not to get you to blush again as you did with the uh, the accolades from Dan, but when your parents were in the audience, they were clearly proud of their son presenting uh, a couple of weeks ago. It was very touching. At the President's See. Forum. Yeah. Those who don't. Yeah, at the, the President's President Forum, and it was very, very touching. Other members? It was a full, well, uh, Richard, you. you were next. Sorry. Sorry. You know, illuminating and helpful. It's not yes, that we can do some of these things. If we can, it'll be a miracle. <laughs> Richard, then I wait. All right. Um, yeah, I, I really appreciate your your presentation here. I, I and I and I appreciate your um, uh, reviewing the, uh, the the principles and and working some of those out. I'll just comment. However, I. I do think some of the effects we see in our schools are more a uh, result of demographic factors than policy factors. The, when you quote uh, uh, Moody's here, um, this is exactly what I would expect from a state that's lost population over 10 years. All, all of its schools are going to have losing population. 
uh, with with some exceptions, and um, and that and that poses very predictable challenges. In the same way, Detroit is somewhat unique in having lost a million population in 25 years. In the 1990s, the black middle class began leaving Detroit, and the Canary um, in the mine were the were the parochial schools, which were the first to lose. Uh, population funding, uh, which was voluntary, and the effects have carried on uh, in Detroit and reflected in Detroit public schools. To be sure, yeah. Uh, just to, to echo, declining enrollment at a statewide level is actually kind of positive because you have fewer students to spread the money over. Right? So yeah. the per pupil can be higher. Yeah. So the, the challenge comes to the individual districts for them losing enrollment is a negative. I just want to underscore, because in, in the rush at the end, the message might have gotten a little blurry. I'm not suggesting that the only source of enrollment decline is charters. Of course, there, you know, it is, you, you, have, you have three big factors. One is, is, is um, the movement of families from certain districts, the whole families go. Changes in the age profile of the district, right? what share of the population is school age, and finally, choice. Okay? And and they 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 they, uh, they, they and, and so choice for some districts is a big part of the story, um, but but it's it's only one part statewide. And I I appreciate your raising uh, the right questions here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eileen. And I was just going to bring out that point that we lose sight so often of the fact that there are a hundred thousand children approximately in charter schools, but another hundred thousand in schools of choice. And there's an interesting story today in, in about Avondale, um, which balanced its 400 student loss with innovations, including um, blended instruction, um, uh, some reduced class sizing, some selling of services to for profits. There's when when you bring up all those peripheral issues besides the money, um, a lot of them can mitigate or for for districts in state in more stable environments, uh, it can mitigate what they're doing right now. The question is, where do we head long term? What are those innovations really going to bring us? Are they going to bring us cost savings or not? And I think when you look at urban districts, the impact of both choice and uh, uh, charter schools probably is you know, much larger than it ever will be for rural or for uh, uh, schools that are out of state. Absolutely. So I, I still think that there's an additional study for somebody here on how districts that are doing it well are functioning, where the patterns are for the wealthier ones and what the patterns are if there are poorer ones. Um, we, we can only do so much to increase the, both the pot of money because um, we are in an area of declining enrollment and uh, as we heard earlier with the, uh, with the first study, um, <coughs> the first uh, uh, discussion, uh, you have fixed costs that you can't do much about except let time help you solve them. And then you have the marginal uh, benefits or costs of students leaving and, and uh, uh, are coming. How we get that, how we get to better information on that part of it, what, what educational provisions um, are possible yeah. given the state right now, and where we could head with better education if we had more money would probably help voters uh, feel as if there were a reason to fund, which certainly was a point that was brought up at Citizens <coughs> Research Council. Yeah. How badly this erodes trust. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I want to build on that point. It's well taken. And I did not devote time to interdistrict choice. Okay. Avondale's a good example. They're going doing good things. Okay. But but schools of choice, the interdistrict choice problem or, or policy, operates to give a cushion to the more advanced to the higher SES districts. Okay. They 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 can they can ease the financial squeeze by opening the gate and letting in non. Uh, resident students, and it's working that way initially. Okay. But it, simultaneously, just as you heard from the previous example, from the presentation, it's it's uh, it's in a sense, uh, uh, you know, their gain is somebody else's loss, and so we've created a system here that you know, when you establish the rules, who the winners are going to be. So the question is, does it make sense from the standpoint of state policy to establish rules like that? Avondale. An excellent question to leave us with. Yeah. <laughs> Avondale, by the way, I spent an hour with their teacher-led team 
and I give Superintendent Heitch a lot of credit for this. That's a teacher-led team district in, a lot, in many respects, and they have invented kind of this model that you're talking about that's just unbelievable. I'd recommend for the half million people that watch us on the Internet, you want to go <laughs> yeah. use that as a model. I, I, I'm with you. I agree. That's great. Well, thanks so much Thank to uh, Thank David. It was very interesting, and, and I would commend, since I've kind of seen this twice now, you can loop it back on the internet and watch it again and pick up some things from both of our presenters today that it takes a while to sink in and today I picked up some points that I kind of missed especially that eight billion Headley thing that's, that's <laughs> a lot of room there so thank you so much uh, David and Craig and Jeff as we said earlier thanks again for being here very very important um, I'll ask Carol and Kyle to join us at the table, and we'll do our best to <coughs> expedite this item. Um, but it's an important one, and I know, just to set the tone, I know that board members, uh, well, Michelle, Kathleen, and Richard served on the tax task force for the model policy on reducing suspensions and expulsions. An important issue. Um, I have some anecdotal reason to believe that some of the kids from dissolved districts who were placed into other districts are experiencing some fairly significant suspensions and expulsions, and I think it's something we need to learn more about before we just willy-nilly make decisions like that as a legislature. Um, and I've asked Carol, to, when this is the end of this year, Carol and Kyle to kind of look further into those two districts and try to track the kids that went to other districts when they were dissolved and see what some of the impact was. Uh, Carol, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Guys. Thank you very much and good morning. Um, the purpose of our presentation today, as um, Mike said, there are three board members who were actively involved um, on a group, is to bring the state board up to date on where we are in a process of working with a group of stakeholders to develop a model state board policy on reducing student suspensions and expulsions. So this is a snapshot in time um, of where we've been, where we are, and where we need to go to complete the process. Um, we had a group of stakeholders. It's a great example of a collaborative effort to um, get the opinions of, of everybody involved. And because this was a NASB grant, um, we always welcome state board participation of at least one member, and this time we had three, um, which is really helpful. Um, we really do need to look at um, what we can do to examine this problem, to take a look at best practices, and then to finally get to the point where we have a model policy for the state board um, that can be adapted and adopted throughout the state. And the good thing about this work is it ties very nicely um, the focus is on some things that we're already looking at and working on together, including reducing barriers to learning. You might have heard us talk about school-to-prison pipeline, um, the dropout challenge, the pathways to potential that we partner um, with the Department of Human Services, and, of course, the statewide truancy definition, which um, Mike led, along with Maura Corrigan for the governor, on getting to a common definition of truancy and building all of this in. So. It's been an exciting process, and, and I'd like to ask Kyle to um, bring you up to date on where we are. Great. Thanks, Carol. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm going to run through a Power, PowerPoint slide <clears throat> a presentation real quick, and Kyle did a great job uh, setting the stage, but we really have worked uh, hard on bringing this policy to you today for consideration to, before we send out um, for public comment. Uh, we had a great group of, of stakeholders that uh, crossed the um, a wide range of disciplines, whether schools or criminal justice, um, uh, community-based organizations that helped to develop this uh, this draft model policy. And like uh, Cheryl mentioned, the board um, input and, and uh, engagement has been great on this piece. So we're, we're very excited for that. So today our purpose is, again, to bring the, bring the board up to date on where we're at um, with the draft policy um, and also provide a short rationale for why we think this is important. I don't think uh, everyone around the table understands the importance and the impact that um, this work has on our overall mission of career and college ready. So I'm going to keep it brief. <clears throat> so why do we need alternatives to suspension and expulsions? Um, 
again, I think we, we all know in, intrinsically that that um, students not in the classroom, not engaged in learning, um, impacts our overall ability to, to um, get our, reach our goal of career and college ready um, for our students. It also ties so closely to a lot of other um, initiatives, as Carol mentioned, that we're working on uh, to keep kids in school. Um, <clears throat> again, not, uh, in our state, we, we struggle with, uh, with data in this area, but we know from national studies that, um, that document um, school disciplinary um, practices that are disproportionately impact youth of color and special education students. Um, they're three times more likely to be suspended and expelled than their peers. Um, and while we don't have Michigan-specific data um, that we uh, could, could say the same thing here, um, we, we know through groups uh, and schools that we're working with that we're funding directly on some of culture and climate issues that they see similar rates of, of expulsion and exclusion amongst those populations. So I think this is a great question. Why, why, why punish students who are already at risk of driving out by suspending them from school, from kicking them out of the school environment? We know that local administrators are in a tough position um, and need to ensure the safety um, um, of their building as well as creating an effective learning environment for their students and staff. But at the same time in our state, we do know that the number, um, in the case of expulsions in our state, we know that more than half of those expulsions are for nonviolent instances. So for instances that are uh, more behavior related versus fighting or, or weapons related. So how do we shift that mindset of um, those students who fall in that category how do we wrap our arms around them? How do we engage in terms of keeping them in school <coughs> and keeping them on task and engaged in learning versus kicking them out? Our challenge, should we choose to accept it, and we already have, um, <laughs> is to encourage schools uh, to be more proactive in the ways that they um, provide student discipline. Um, we've been working very hard, not only in this process, but with other um, um, grant initiatives and other um, um, projects in, in the department to try and tie in how do we increase preventative practices, how do we increase um, the promotion of social and emotional learning. You know, I think, um, as we saw with the Mental Health Commission report released uh, last month, there's a lot of mental health issues that are tied into what the behavior that ultimately gets students suspended or expelled. So there's a, you know, a huge tie there that we're, we're trying to connect and, and, and uh, articulate that connection. Um, we've been increasing our capacity at the state level to train personnel. And, and what works, positive behavioral interventions and supports and restorative practices are, are initiatives and, and um, not necessarily programs, but they're um, um, strategies that, that address the behavior but also keep kids in school at the same time. So we're trying to promote uh, the, the wider use of those. Um, we're, we're working with administrators to try and reserve exclusion and expulsion for the most serious offenses, primarily violent related offenses. And we're trying to work with schools on how they can use the data that they do have locally to make better decisions about what limited resources and capacity they have to address the needs of their students. So here's our target. This is where we're getting to, right? This is where we're, we're focused at. Um, I think in this work um, and the work of our team here at the department, you know, one question we've been asking ourselves is imagine how much further we could get towards meeting that mission um, if we had significant number of hours um, of students in school. Because right now, whether it's just suspensions and expulsions, um, or as Carol mentioned earlier, our work on truancy, we know that there are hundreds of thousands of hours in our state <laughs> that students are missing every year that doesn't allow students, that is impeding their learning and also impeding the ability for teachers um, to teach. Uh, early in the uh, summer of 2013, we were funded by the National um, Association of State Boards of Education. We were one of three states uh, funded for this work to look at disciplinary practices. Um, Georgia and West Virginia were the other two states that were funded along with us, and we, um, uh, we received $5,000 from them to do this kind of planning work. Um, we've been able to leverage partnerships uh, uh, within the department as well as outside the department to make those dollars go further and uh, you know expand this work. Um, the grant objectives are listed there. We are to, we're checking off number one on that bulleted list today. Um, we're also going to be working uh, with our partners to develop um, additional resources, an online toolkit um, to help support schools that want to make changes um, to their disciplinary structure. Um, so we'll be working on that in the coming months. 
Uh, again, over 40 members participated in, in the task force. We had uh, uh, three different meetings of the task force. Um, uh, board members, um, Michelle Pectow, Kathleen Strauss, and Dr. Richard Ziley all participated, and we, we appreciate their engagement and, their, and the thought that they brought to, to that work. Uh, we had great input from local administrators um, and educators, as well as uh, other state agencies and community-based organizations that are working in this area. Uh, we structured, um, we had very structured feedback for how we worked with the group. We wanted to really target and uh, capitalize on the brain power we had in the room during our meetings to, to, to focus on, on, on big picture issues that were related to the to policy. Uh, with the assistance of the Great Lakes Comprehensive Center uh, with American Re Institutes for Research, we were able to, again, leverage kind of our, our capacity and, and do some more detailed focus work. Um, uh, on the policy of, of, from the members, uh, from the members of the group. The, uh, I know the, the funnest part is not the most politically correct term, but it really was, was working um, to do the, the parent and student focus groups that we did as part of this work. Uh, we conducted six student focus groups and four um, parent focus groups around the state to get um, feedback directly from students and parents about issues that they're facing in the district and districts around suspension and expulsions and disciplinary practices. And you know the I mean I think the one thing that we took away from from those conversations were, you know, students get it. They understand um, when when um, disciplinary practices are applied uh, differently. And you know, kind of at our level, we see and we mentioned the data earlier around race and ethnicity being a difference. It's it's also they also recognize the differences that are applied among staff in a building. So when you think about a secondary level where a student may see five, six, seven teachers in a day that uh, you know, the, those discipline practices that are set by the district in that building may look different amongst those, amongst their teachers, and, and, and they question why that is, quite honestly. And they also have a, 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 a different mindset than I think uh, adults have in schools, is they really feel that discipline should be uh, a teaching tool, and that they're okay with stricter penalties um, as long as there's increased supports for um, addressing the behavior that they that they exhibited that caused them to be in trouble and, and addressed it versus just pushing them out the door. Our next steps after today is we will um, seek uh, public comment on a more broader level. Again, we, we had a, a wide number of organizations that, that um, worked on this issue as part of the group, but we want to get more feedback because uh, we couldn't have everybody in the state in the room to discuss, so we're going to do that. And I'd be remiss if I didn't um, give shout outs to um, for Cheryl Bailey and I think I saw us back and, and uh, Great Lakes uh, for their support of our work in terms of the process. We wouldn't be able to have done as much as we've done, as well as Nancy Searching, um, who helped organize our parent and student focus groups and was, was at um, all of them and have gathered all the data and, and, and gave it back to us in a way we could use it. And then Polly Brainer from our team here at the department, um, who's really quarterbacked uh, the work of the task force. So we appreciate their work. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Mike. And, you know, Kyle, by the way, Carol's been a long-term leader in this, but Kyle uh, is always the first to give credit where it's due, of course, uh, with the folks in the department. He's also just been sensational <coughs> at this and leading this and working with DHS. And this is kind of the dark underbelly, the dirty secret a little bit of what's going on in schools. And I often think that if we don't have a fair accountability system and why we need smarter balance, you are going to tempt fate even beyond where we are now in order for kids like I used to be, but kids that are potentially considered problems, but also academically not where the, the team wants them, the school wants them to be, to fall into easier suspension and expulsion so that they're not actually part of an accountability model. So I, I think it uh, just as an aside, I think it's another evidence of why we need a fair accountability system. Teachers are overwhelmingly open to being accountable. They just want it to be fair. And we're worried about it. When you look at the hearings recently, we're worried about this. Are we going to actually follow through on the law and put in place using appropriate growth measures like Smarter Balance will be able to offer ways that we can do this? So it's kind of a, an ancillary point to this. Um, but it's very distressing when you look at some of the statistics from our earlier presenters. It, how, how are some of the most struggling districts going to do better academically when you have these gigantic numbers of kids that aren't in school 
and often for behavior that does not justify, as you, as you know from the model, uh, especially expulsion. Um, so, board member, Eileen, please. It's terrific. Um, uh, and I know how much um, new think and new kinds of discussions had to go into this. Um, as someone who's watched for 11 years on the board criminalization of children's behavior, and I, and I, I will grant you in a situation where we haven't revised um, the zero to tolerance policy, it's difficult to bring the word criminalization into this. It's very positive. But I also feel that that needs to be in there because that's what we're doing. We're even if you don't discuss zero tolerance policy, which is zero tolerance, if, which I'm hoping will be changed sometime in the next year, it still is an issue of if people don't do this, it inevitably ends up in criminalization of, of minor offenses. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think to leave it out, um, uh, you know, we're just ignoring a big part of the problem. Uh, but I, I also, it's very elegant the way it is, and I, I, I appreciate you going after, hey, let's do this, <coughs> it's the right thing for kids. Mm -hmm. But I think you should mention what the wrong thing is. And I, you, bring up, you bring up a good point. Um, our, our hope and our, our kind of our plan was to address that specific piece in the revised model code of student conduct that we're prepping to bring to the board in May and to identify what behavior we'd like to see and what behaviors we know that are going on that that shouldn't be going on. So, I mean, we could reference it in this piece, but in order to, I think, get to the detailed level that you're, you're discussing, that we would need to address it in a more um, comprehensive way in the model code of student conduct. And I would say something like the cascade of events that happens once a student is not in school. The cascade of events? Ca what? The cascade of, of uh, uh, inappropriate uh, uh, outcomes that happen when, when children are not allowed to stay in school mm -hmm. for minor offenses. Mm -hmm including the criminalization. I mean, if there's just some right. way of bringing that into it, because right now it's, it's just like, let's do this, it's the right thing, but mm -hmm. the wrong thing is going on all over the state, and to leave that part out, I think, weakens this. It's a good point. Good point. Mm -hmm. yes, John, please, then Lupe, I then Dan. Eileen's comments and the effort and leadership and work from colleagues and Kyle and Carol on advancing a model policy, I'm not sure it's a model policy. I, I assume that a key to it is to somehow get to the training of uh, people in the buildings and in education on the positive behavioral interventions and different practices, which we know can be effective. I've seen, I've talked to some of the kids involved with those. Um, I, my, my concern, uh, how, how much can schools do that training and absorb it or organize it themselves per the policy without resources? Um, mm -hmm. We don't have, as far as I can tell, any dedicated grant or other resources to help them implement it. So it becomes another very needed good thing we're asking education uh, educators to do, and we'd like them to do, but as a state, we're not offering some support like the teacher sure. evaluation, which we're also discussing. Have you seen folks able to do this with what they've got, and or is there anything that we should be alongside this encouraging in terms of legislation or others that would have some resources attached. Mm -hmm. I mean, two pieces, I think, to your, your second question. Yes, there are districts and administrators who, who see this cycle and want to make a change that have made a change with existing resources. Um, on, on the other hand, there's also districts that need additional supports. And to the best of our ability, while we haven't been able to scale it up statewide yet, we've been working to do that specifically. I think we'll be able to provide some of those resources that schools that want to have a, have somebody who's engaged that has a passionate leader locally that will take this on, that our toolkit and additional resources that we're going to develop as part of this effort will be supportive to them. We've also tried to increase our capacity statewide, um, for instance, with restorative practices and, and working with the uh, um, dispute resolution centers around the state to increase their capacities to support schools. We have schools that want to use it but don't have the resources to bring those staff in and so we're trying to at a state level per increase that capacity, increase that training from that perspective. And I do think with the uh, um, potential money that's appropriated as part of the Mental Health Commission that um, there's a good opportunity for us to leverage dollars um, in conversation with the governor's office to increase training for, for staff specifically around mental health related issues which again um, I think play a large part in the behavior of, of some of the behavior that gets kids kicked out to begin with. Sure. Um, I just remind, didn't, didn't the president nationally just 
call for some new yes. expectations around this? And mm -hmm. is there any likelihood that that national call will mm -hmm. result in anything that helps us move forward, uh, financial or otherwise, or even policy insistence wise? The guidelines that you, you referenced came out actually right before our third meeting of this group, mm -hmm. so it's perfect timing for us to. Um, incorporate anything that we hadn't thought about um, as part of that, so we were able to do that. Um, just recently, I saw a funding forecast for U.S. Department of Ed funding, and there are two or three different um, funding things that are proposed in the, in, the, in the president's budget that are specific to culture and climate. Uh, I think we're in a, a great position to leverage those dollars and have access to those dollars. We're already funded um, under culture and climate uh, school culture and climate money. Uh, we were one of 11 states that were funded three years ago, and we've done some great work with that. So I think we're well poised to maybe access those dollars as well, um, and we can use those dollars to increase the capacity that we've, we've asked about. One other point on funding. Um, Michelle, as the NASB delegate, we're going to have an opportunity perhaps to apply for additional funds through NASB, except that because we were one of the first states to get funded, they want to expand their efforts. So as you work with your um, NASB connection, you might uh, say what a great job this group is doing with our first grant. We really should get a second one. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, Lupe, Dan, Richard, Michelle. Lupe's next? L Lupe. Oh, okay, well, th and this is something that all classroom teachers, <coughs> principals, uh, cafeteria workers, bus drivers, anybody in a school system would like and, and need and have been aspiring to have uh, some guideline to make these suspensions and expulsions a little bit less, a little bit easier for the, the classrooms uh, and wherever they are, in the cafeteria, wherever they are, that there are learning safe environments. And uh, so when you say that you had 40 members in your committee, I am assuming that you had classroom teachers, you had building principals, maybe cafeteria workers, bus drivers, all kinds of educators uh, to to put some to get input into this uh, policy. Uh, so uh, now, when when a, a child is expelled or suspended from a building. There's a process, and you talked about a discipline code or something that you're going to be, put, be putting in place in conjunction with what the school districts already have. Uh, so the, um, I, I think it was, correct me if I'm wrong, but back in 2001, um, the board had adopted a model code of student conduct, and it hasn't been revised since then. Um, it would really be an opportunity for us as the department and the board to really set an expectation of how we would like to see a disciplinary structure work, a discipline structure work, or a code of conduct work in a school building. Right. And so we, we know a lot more now than we did back in 2001, and we've been able to see data-wise across the state how previous practices or, and or current practices aren't working and how they're negatively impacting students. Okay, well, so when they take the child in, through the process, we fill uh, uh, some corrective form, and, but then there's hearings, they go to the student services office. I mean, there's a long process. So when you say that they're loosely suspended for minor offenses, I don't understand what you're talking about because I know in the school districts they have a process and it's extensive process. Uh, that the child has to go through, the parents have to come to hearings, and all these kind of things. So when you say minor offenses, what kind of offenses are you talking about? Uh, well, um, in some of the districts we've been working with on climate and culture that we're funding directly, you know, we've seen examples where administrators are suspending kids for not having their shirt tucked in because they violate the dress code. <coughs> um, for other... Um, I guess things like that that you know aren't disrupting the learning environment that aren't unsafe okay. um, that that uh, we see administrators um, and schools quicker to suspend those kids um, to send a message to some extent but you know our, our 
our response back to that is, how can we send a message about the importance of keeping that environment the way that that school wants to have it, but also keep them engaged in learning and not, you know, off right. at home? Well, and one last thing, I, I know that educators, period, what, I don't, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what capacity in the building that they work in, even the bus drivers that don't work in the building, you know, but they transport. I know we're all looking for something else, and we used to have timeout rooms, we used mm -hmm. to have many different uh, alternatives. Okay. Uh, and so hopefully those are kind of things that will be placed into this model, so, and the funding comes with, because it, mm -hmm. that's the bottom line, there's no funding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank the, you. The timeout rooms is a great <coughs> option. By the way, I used to just walk the halls and say, tuck your shirt in. Tuck the shirt in. You don't have to suspend them. Oh, just tell them to tuck, tuck the shirt in. It's not that difficult. And they do it. Kids, kids almost want the guidance. They just don't want to be suspended for something that's... Um, Dan, and then uh, Richard, and then Michelle. Um, so thank you guys for this. I, uh, this is really important work. So thank you for it. Um, three quick things. One is, um, so alternatively, we refer to this as a uh, kind of model code of conduct and then sometimes as a kind of statement or model policy around reducing suspensions and expulsions. Mm -hmm. Is there a distinction to be drawn between those? Um, it feels more like actually after having read it, a policy on reducing student suspensions and expulsions than a student code of conduct. It just feels like we should probably be clear about that um, in everything that we say, if that's in fact what it is, as opposed to a code of conduct. They are separate pieces. Um, sorry if I spoke too quickly earlier. We are going to bring um, a separate model code of student conduct back to the board in May um, that will be separate from okay. this policy that will focus specifically on, um, again, setting a kind of vision for what we think a code of conduct structure should look like and address some of the pieces that Eileen had mentioned in a more detailed way than we could do in this document. Right. So it's both? Yes. We're doing both. Great. Um, second is really, I just have to say, was really struck by the, uh, so in looking at the student uh, and parent, the report summarizing the student and parent um, uh, focus groups, the ratio of six students who thought uh, uh, discipline was being applied fairly to the 21 uh, who did not is just stunning. I mean, that's, that's crazy. Um, and suggests that, uh, it, so I have teenagers, like I get that sometimes they feel like things are being applied unfairly. Um, and if the ratio of complaints is 21, dad, there's a problem, to six, no, you're doing it right, I got a problem. Right, and we should all acknowledge that as adults in the system, like we have a problem when kids are telling us at a ratio of 21 to 6 that we're not doing it right. That's just problematic. Um, the last thing is in the third paragraph of the statement, um, the second paragraph, I just want to argue for removing the word, however. Um, the first sentence here is that the State Board of Education remains absolutely committed to policies that preserve the safest environment possible for all members of Michigan school communities. Second sentence, mounting evidence suggests, however, that safety and educational outcomes can be improved by increasing prevention efforts that focus on social emotional development, et cetera. Like, there's no however there. Like, mounting evidence suggests, like, we care about this, and mounting evidence suggests that this is the way that we should act because of that. So, like, no let's problem. take the however out of that, which just leans, <laughs> lends credence to the folks who suggest something to the contrary, and state it as an affirmative, which is what it is. Okay. Of course. <laughs> okay. However. Good point. Richard and Michelle. However. I had some uh, mixed feelings uh, serving on this, on this particular committee, one of which was because there were about four teachers out of 40. Uh, I felt outnumbered by the attorneys and social workers and, and others. And um, second, uh, there were some issues, for example, the, the Zero tolerance was criticized, but on the other hand, a lot of the suspensions, which didn't have anything to do with zero tolerance, were, were put forth as evidence to deal with. Um, I, I do feel that, I do feel that uh, I'm told that this is a, this is a problem, that, it's, that we can do better. I, I can believe that, and I hope that what the committee generates will, will do that. Um, but um, I wasn't sure that that I'm not I'm not sure that the uh, 
being against zero <laughs> tolerance. I mean, if, if the problem is not in the policy, but the way the policy is being applied, you know, kids are getting suspended for, for a clothing violations, uh, that, you know, the zero tolerance has got nothing to do with, with those kinds of decisions. And, um, uh, and if it's not a problem with the policy as written, but rather with, with, with what's being done, then, the, then changing the policy is probably not going to affect uh, the misapplication, misunderstandings that are, that are going on and kids being suspended for trivial things. I think the real, I think a real core issue that we ought to be concerned about is um, we, we need to adopt a principle like if, if a school is receiving funding for a student, then that school is responsible for knowing where the student is during the school day, okay? and for providing compensatory instruction if the student is suspended. Um, and especially that uh, the student needs to take the, the, the expected tests and the school needs to be held accountable. I think those things, accountability for the student, responsibility for the student, accountability for testing, uh, and the funding all need to go together and we, we should never allow them to be separated. So I think that's the real core policy at our level uh, that that we ought to be ought to be concerned with. As for how it's used on on the local levels, I, I guess I'm more philosophically inclined to allow local districts to develop their policies. One of the the big issues with fairness um, is simply expectations. So where you have a chaotic community and nobody knows what to expect, anything that happens seems to be unfair. Okay, the last two guys got away with it and I got caught. That's not fair, okay? Uh, on the other hand, if you have consistent expectations, and that has to be part of developing a school culture, um, then it's, it's mainly a matter of accepting what the rules are and uh, our, our ratio of seven to two. I mean, I, that may be the problem of the culture, not uh, of, of having not a consistent culture rather than an inconsistent culture rather than um, uh, something being wrong in principle with the rules that are that are that they're attempting to to enforce and a final issue is um, uh, yeah we've heard a lot of recommendations for this um, uh, uh, now I'm having a senior moment uh, the the cooperative discipline, the uh, positive discipline, restorative. restorative discipline. Thank you. That's the word I was looking for. Welcome to your forties. <laughs> <laughs> and and bless you for yeah. <laughs> um, I think this is the sort of thing. If if this is truly an effective method, this is what professional development is for. You don't need extra subsidies for these kinds of things. You you point it out and say this is worth spending your professional development time and funding on. Uh, you don't need a special, uh, you ought not need a special my time will be program. We're, we're, we're asking them to train on Common Core, train on teacher evaluation, yeah. lots of things. So, you know, there's, there's competing claims on uh, Agreed. Agreed. My Thank turn? you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I just wanted to say that um, I, how much I appreciate the team and the folks that were there. I mean, many people had very strong opinions, including me, and I think people were really heard, and um, and adjustments were made. <coughs> I know the 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 one session that I thought was really um, it was one of the best sessions I've ever been to with brainstorming. It included because at first there were the initial meeting there were there were um, people from the local. Uh, school districts, mm. but they there were there at the end. There were people, you know, uh, uh, vice principals and um, uh, principals, and, and every they broke into teams, and it was a real diverse group, and it really enriched the conversation a lot. I thought it was very good, and we all had a task to do, and it was very well facilitated. And um, so I really um, appreciate that approach and listening to different points of view and really trying to accommodate that. Um, I thought it was very useful. One thing that came out that I just wanted to point out to the rest of the board that I thought uh, was uh, an issue that I think would help support um, us and other states if they're going to do this is having a, figuring out a way to get more data because it was really a limited amount of data 
to really try to weed out what the problems were because it doesn't seem like there's really uh, it's hard to track uh, on on a local level who's suspending and uh, and ex expelling and and you know the reasons and to to really compare so there's very broad um, information that we have like um, you know as you mentioned um, uh, young black men and um, special ed and low income seem to be have higher rates of but then where are they going to school what is the rules in those schools what is the environment what is the I mean that kind of stuff would really help tailor and we need to figure out a way to do that I also was wondering because um, if you're going to be having uh, focus groups with teachers I know parents and students were there will there be focus groups with teachers too we haven't we haven't uh, done those to date. Um, okay. I think that's something we could could build in, especially yeah. as we're um, as we're uh, doing doing work on, on the truancy definition. Um, right. As part of the focus groups we did do, we asked kind of kind of bigger ticket things, not only about suspension and expulsions, but also around truancy and other issues. So we could we could look at um, maybe using some of the resources that we have from NASB to to conduct those. And I can tell you that I my daughter. And I was, got to, to my opinion, two trivial suspensions, but that's my opinion. <laughs> one for kissing her boyfriend in front of the school, which I've told her not to do anymore. And <laughs> one for, um, the other one, oh, she received a text of a fight in the school. She didn't send it, but she received it, and she received a suspension. Well, but the, in the past, where I think they, she would have had an out-of-school suspension, what they have is an overnight suspension, where I have to come in with her the next morning, and they won't let her into school unless I come in which is great for her, I guess. <laughs> but I mean, but when I talked to the vice, you know, the, the vice principal, he was explaining to me about how they're trying not to suspend and there's this, so he was, and this is a Detroit Public School um, high school. So it, it seems like there's something in the air, people are hearing this. Um, and my last point is when we talk about zero tolerance um, in that, it's often uh, doesn't look at mitigating circumstances. It doesn't take into a holistic approach. Um, I think that a lot of the reforms that we have in the schools that are creating larger class sizes, and I see it, they're getting rid of social workers, psychologists, all this support, and they're, they're putting special ed kids into regular ed kids, and not necessarily with teachers who are trained on the behaviors of those special ed kids, or even know that those kids are special ed kids, and what their accommodations need to be. So I also think, um, and, my, and this is what I wish I had data for, is those that are most uh, greatly impacted by the, some of the deficit, the financial deficits, if they're the ones who are having the hardest time in maintaining control in the, in the school, um, given the, the decrease in the staffing and in the support that would be needed to address some of the needs of students, like the, the school social workers are other, you know, just having a smaller class size so the kids could, you know, the uh, teachers ha could have a better idea of the needs of the students. And does that have an impact? That, that would be, that would be, it seems common sense. I just want to have, see if research would support it, my sure. hypothesis. But anyway, um, and I do have one last point. I do, sorry. The zero tolerance that they have in school is also, they, they need to have that in the court system. And there's also issues of profiling. There's also, you know, this, this mandatory drug sentencing, when they look at the school to prison pipeline, I think we all need to look at it broadly. It's not just the school that has these zero tolerance policies, our society has it. And they, uh, they often are not fair. They don't, they, um, they don't give uh, the adequate discretion to mitigating circumstances. So I am done now. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. you know, and to your good point on data, um, this might be an opportunity when we get this to local boards and superintendents that we have what we've talked about before, a joint letter, maybe this time signed by the, by the board members who were part of this initiative, um, to encourage them, in spite of Headley, to provide us the data, which we think is going to help us, blah, blah, blah. That's right. been the catch-22, but I think with your encouragement, um, we could get people to do this on, on their own. And right now the data is so limited, it, uh, it frankly it gives the naysayers some ammunition that we're extrapolating from knowledge that we really don't have. I don't think that's accurate, by the way, but this would take care of it. Yes, ma'am, you had it. And then Dan. Yes, Kath? Well, I do want to say, of course, that I support this 
uh, wholeheartedly, but I'm, I'm concerned of the zero tolerance policies that we have now, which would require people to be expelled for 180 days, and they can't attend any other school in the, right. the state, right. according to the law. So your suggestion that the, the, the expelling district should be responsible for making sure they have an education would be a step in the right direction. Now they're out there getting into trouble, no doubt. And, and there's, there's nobody, the, their parents don't know what to do. There's no place to go. So that's something that we should be looking at, I think, is what happens to the kids that are expelled under the policy. That's a policy. That's the legislation. Maybe we could alter. I mean, because these are the kids who need to be taught, especially need to be taught, it seems to me. So that's, that's an issue. And I think Michelle's point about the data is really important, too. So everything else, I'm, I'm glad you brought up what you brought up, and that was great. So looking forward to implementing this. May, thank you, Kath. May I, based on John's coaching, say, doesn't mean we can't come back to this in a moment, but right. there's a gentleman who's going to, under item C, who has to catch a plane. So why don't we just for a moment at least, <laughs> if you guys don't mind abandoning the end of the table, <laughs> and, and if the board would like, we can come back to this in a moment. And, and John, let me let you introduce yeah, that um, then. Murali Balaji, the director of the Education Curriculum Reform at uh, the Hindu American Foundation in Washington. But they contacted me. They have both national and local in Michigan. Um, and come on up, Murali. Um, Murali, I'm sorry. They have um, I, I resources and contract. people to it's try to be available to help <coughs> educators here in Michigan, physically based, but also available more broadly that his organization coordinates, to try to help educators appropriately deliver uh, instruction when it touches the Hindu religion, uh, Indian history, which is often subject to misinterpretation. So I wanted to give them that chance to share five minutes on those opportunities would have done it in public participation, but uh, has to catch a plane, so uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Austin, and, and thank you to the honorable uh, state board members. I'll take actually less than five minutes of your time. Before my flight, I have to make a presentation at Mary Grove College in Detroit, so oh. thankfully the speed limit's here are 70 miles per hour. <laughs> and I'll be able to um, so I just wanted to briefly chat this conversation from the morning actually ties in. I mean, when we talk about resources in uh, Michigan public schools, um, the reason why I am here is that, unfortunately, Hinduism, when taught in our public schools, there's still an overarching narrative that's inaccurate. And um, so you'll have schools in Oakland County, for example, that do have larger numbers of Hindu American students. But the question is, what about the students in uh, areas that don't have any Hindu Americans or don't have as much diversity. For us, the goal of making sure that all schools have the most up-to-date and accurate resources about Hinduism is to prepare the African American student in Flint, the Arab American student in Dearborn, the German American student in Grand Rapids, to have the same basic understanding about Hinduism. I mean, Michigan is one of the most progressive states in terms of inclusivity in education. We saw that after 9-11, how Michigan public schools made a very, very concerted attempt to make sure all students had accurate understandings about Islam. And so what we're here to provide are free teacher trainings and free resources to any school district um, and obviously any teacher who's interested. The reason why is uh, I, I often get comments from teachers who say, well, I just have the uh, parent of one of my students come in, or I have the local temple come in. As you all know, that's a violation of separation of church and state. And what we're here to do is make sure that teachers have vetted resources, uh, vetted by academics, and make sure that uh, all of the materials, when uh, teaching according to local standards are accurate uh, when it comes to teaching about Hinduism. Again, there's a significant difference between teaching about religion, which is what public schools do, and teaching religion. And so uh, I, I travel across the country uh, teaching uh, 
training teachers on how to better teach about it. With Common Core, for example, the implementation uh, aspect of it, we want to make sure that teachers are better able to teach, uh, train their teach, uh, students in critical inquiry, for example. Uh, learning about the development of ancient Indian civilization and key philosophical concepts. So I passed around a Hinduism to go card. If you flip it around, <laughs> you know, in just one 40 minute class, you'll get some of the key philosophical concepts about Hinduism. And so I might have flown in from DC, but this is deeply impactful for the longtime residents of Michigan. For example, Mr. Venkat Lakshmi Narayanan, who has been a longtime resident of Ann Arbor and a retired Ford Motor Company employee whose daughters went to Michigan public schools. You know, Hindu Americans have been here for, in this state, for over 50 years. And also to understand that not all Hindu Americans <coughs> are from India. That's, I think, another important <laughs> distinction that we should make. Um, and so, as I said, I'm here presenting mainly as a resource. I've already spoken with Linda Forward. I will be in contact with Kyle and Jim Cameron uh, at MDE, and we will make sure that MDE uh, and any <coughs> school district that's interested has all the resources at their disposal. So I really thank you all for your time. Um, my contact information is with Marilyn. If you need to get a hold of me individually, I'd be happy to follow up as well. And again, I thank you so much for your time on, on a busy day. And I'll be on my way to Detroit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks to both of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And any further follow up for Kyle or Carol? More cards. Do you have any more cards? Oh, yeah. Okay. I, well, they're kind of I won't tempt fate any further. Thank huh? you. How about discussion yeah. regarding criteria for grant program? <coughs> Anyone have any questions? Stay up. I think it's just one item today. National School Lunch Grant. Are we okay? Okay. Thank you. Then let's recess for lunch, and when would you like to reconvene? It's actually 20 after 12. That's a little... One o'clock? One o'clock. We'll reconvene sharply at one o'clock. And uh, you know what? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's okay.